An Age of Sigmar story phase. Grab your hammer so we can clear a path through the chaos and forge our own narratives in the Age of Sigmar. Your allies through the realm roots this episode are. Hi, I'm Paul. And uh, did I ever tell you that my father was a forest ranger? No. Kind of taught me a lot. Um, so I kind of have a way with woods. <laughs> Oof. Uh, I'm Davey. And like the Sylvaneth, I've heard that song that calls you to war. For me, though, it sounds a lot like the puns that are coming out in this introduction. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm Will. And if you think about it, Alariel is really just an old hermit, just asking for people to leave her alone. <laughs> also true. Uh, and I'm Aaron. And I have discovered the knowledge of my structure and purpose that may be passed down such that later generations may instinctively know the glorious traditions of their ancestors and thus perpetuate them. And it's this very podcast, The Mortal Realms. Hey, oh, oh. <laughs> In this episode, we cover the lore of the Sylvaneth Battle Tome. Get ready to hear a whole lot about trees missing the forest for them, barking up the wrong ones, and pining after them. And then if we have time after all that, we'll talk about those stone-cold birches. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Uh, my fellow <laughs> old kings. <laughs> yes. Not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're the only one, Will. All right, don't yeah. don't brag about it. All right, <laughs> doing great, excellent. Glad to hear it. How about the other the other two? Uh, pretty good. Kids are on summer break, which uh, is always a big change in how my time is spent. <laughs> um, but it's pretty fun. Been hitting the pool, camping, all that sort Ooh, of thing. Nice. So, right on. Yeah. We joined the pool for the first time this summer, actually, because my kids are finally old enough to probably appreciate it. And so that also is, yeah, it's a different it's a different vibe for sure. Will, how are you? I'm doing good. Uh, getting used to a new job. So just kind of bouncing back and forth between the walls, th staying up later. So I'm more hyped than ever. Yeah, nice. Glad to hear it. Hype is good, right? That's, that the kids oh, yeah. say that's good. All right, so good. good. Uh, take some of that energy out here on the podcast. Leave it all on the floor. <laughs> um, <laughs> Excellent. Well, guys, we're, uh, we've got a great uh, story phase. We're going to be talking about the Sylvaneth Battle Tome and the lore contained within. But before we do, as we always uh, start, I'd love to I'd love to know what you guys have been up to in the hobby. And we might as well just continue the same order that we started in. And so, Paul, please do us a favor and tell us what you've been doing in the hobby. Paint us a picture of the things you've been painting in real life. I mean, that would take me quite a while. Uh, I, I do paint, but, you know, it takes me a while to paint a whole picture. Um, but uh, uh, just Oof. let's say, Oof. you can't do this to me. I've been off for two episodes. You can't, <laughs> you can't just throw me in like this. I mean, ease them into it. Uh, You're expecting me to do it myself. There's only so much I can uh. do. Um, so thank you, GW, for sending us the Echoes of Doom. I got to paint up the Lady of Vines, uh, which is an amazing miniature. It is, um, cool. and we're gonna talk about her probably a little bit. Um, so, um, that's basically what I've been doing because. As Davey said, my kids are on spring on summer break, and like we've literally been on vacation almost all of June. I think I've maybe got seven days where somebody isn't visiting or we aren't going somewhere. So I'm waiting for that to calm down a little bit before <laughs> anything else happens. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Right on. Um, all right, Davey. Speaking of Davey, hey bud, what you uh, what you been up to in the hobby? I uh, started painting the Cunning Crew, so the uh, Warhammer Underworlds Warband for the. Uh, cruel boys um and uh i was i is manok the cunning has his head in this cage yeah. super obnoxious mm. to try to figure out how to paint that so it's uh, the first time in a long time that i did sub assemblies and by sub assembly i mean there's one part i didn't stick on <laughs> so uh but it encouraged me to do and i don't often do this like i will often do like all base coats and then do the next step uh on each thing here i was like while i've got his face available to me i'm going to fully paint up all the skin on all these guys, like do all the layers and details and all that sort of thing. Uh, and it was a really good way to get hyped about the model. Cause like, yeah, I like the skin is looking real good. Uh, I'm really happy about this. Uh, and so, uh, I'm about 85% done, but it's the fastest I've painted something and felt good about it in a long time. I, I've burned through some other projects quickly, like my purifiers, which are fine, but I wasn't super happy with, but did them quickly. These, it was just that uh, different twist on on uh, the order of things. So, um, yeah, pretty excited. They're all they're all kind of pale, super uh, pallid looking, um, like they don't get much sun because they're way down in the Harrow Deep underworld. Yeah, yeah, 
Mm. So painted them and playing them a lot. Right. Five games Great. in with them. I mean, I know this is an Underworlds podcast, but how you feeling about them? Good? Bad? In yeah, I like them. They they uh, they have a lot of uh, cunning tricks. They were too cunning for me the first time out, but I, I'm kind of uh, coming to grips with them. They have a card you can play called Overthink, uh, which is very representative of uh, <laughs> how it's very thematic. It's it's kind of like the on I, the I nose. A, I started a blog series uh, which I recently returned to, and you know, I, I got to pick a card for each warband that I represent, and I've already tagged Overthink. I don't use it, but it is so. So exactly like how I feel when using this war band that it's got to be, so. <laughs> makes makes my uh, makes my mork muscle hurt. I think <laughs> um, I saw that you were, you did the the um, blog post and I stopped for a minute and I thought to myself, has Davy Davy been doing this blog this whole time? And I just flat out have not noticed. And I real quick looked at your past entry and I oof, breathed a sigh of relief that no, I had not missed any. Um. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A mere 10 months in between. At that rate, I should uh, wrap up all the warbands in about 38 years if they stop producing warbands right now. So they'll be dead by then. I mean, what? On target. Um, Rude. <laughs> all right. We're all going to go to Underworlds by then? Is that what you're saying? I hope so. Mm. Regardless. Uh, hey, Will, what you've been doing uh, in the old hobby there? Uh, nothing too exciting. I am picking up my own Echoes of Doom box. So while I'm waiting for that to arrive, I've just been playing around with the uh, Sylvan Neff models I already have and actually just like working on paint schemes uh, in preparation. Okay, cool. Did you ever end up finishing your deep king? Because I know that was the last, that was like the last thing you were working on last time. I, I have painted a model of the deep king. They're still the ones I'm going to be like playing for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, we're here to talk about Sylvan Neff and I, <laughs> I can feel uh, the call. Uh, oh, sure. Of the song? I just want to, yeah. Exactly. The, the song is playing and I want to get some models. Uh, I want them to be allies for my Deepkin. Okay, right on. And when okay. the song plays, you we got to dance. You got some dragon spites in your tummy? Is that what you're saying? all right and we've been working on still daughter stuff guys man i'm i'm the worst person to even give these updates I, I know at one point uh, i was like oh there's two things i flat out don't want to do i don't want to do whip ladies and i don't want to do warlock horse people and i thought you know what what better way to solve this problem by to do both of them at the same time so that i can upset myself in different ways uh depending <laughs> on where i'm sitting just balances out simple mathematics yeah right um uh, two wrongs making a worse wrong um and so that's what i've been working on but once those two are done daughters are, are in the in the can that's not a phrase uh, wrap them up uh box them up and never to be seen again and then guess what i'll also circle back to the echoes of doom sylvaneth stuff because i've got a whole bunch of sylvaneth st stuff already built and i can't have unbuilt sylvaneth that's ludicrous and so i have to well i'll do you know, what i need to to add to that um growing force that will also get boxed up and never looked at again um <laughs> And so that's about it. All right, cool. Anybody else got any other uh, updates in your old personal lives that you want to share before we keep going? Let's keep it rolling. Seems some head shakes. Excellent. Um, all right, normally this is the part of the show where I would then jump into the story phase, but sorry, listeners, um, we're mixing things up today. Before we get to the story phase, and oh boy, it's going to be a good one. I wanted to sneak in some Mortal Realms plugs real fast. Uh, and you know what? I'll tell you the reason why, in case you're curious, because normally they, they are tacked onto the end of the show, uh, but nobody ever gets that far, right? Like <laughs> you fall asleep before you reach that point. And so for one, those of you. One man gets that far, and his name is Klaus M.A. <laughs> yes, Klaus. <laughs> Friend of the show, Klaus M.A. I say, I barely stay. The whole episode, and I'm in most of them. Yeah, we're, we're not going to make it. <laughs> I've fallen asleep the like seven with, of them. I mean, come on. Yeah, you hear Paul snoring in the background. <laughs> yeah. uh, the point is this: I want to talk to you guys about the moral realms. Um, so, first and foremost. Listeners, if you can find more episodes of this here podcast that you're listening to right now, but then also all the other podcasts on the Mortal Realms Network at uh, themortalrealms.com. Remember the the, don't forget it. Um, also, you can email any feedback that you might have uh, to mortalrealms at gmail.com. And in that case, there's no the. So real confusing right off the bat. Um, you can find our Patreon at patreon.com slash the mortal realms or the mortal realms.com slash Patreon uh, to support the show. You can get early releases of the story phase, which is this show right now. And then you can also get access to semi-exclusive content like the Pocket Realms, which are short story phases hosted by Davey and yours truly, this guy, Aaron. You can't mm -hmm. see me. I'm pointing at myself. Those are super good. <laughs> so, like, 
yeah, they're they're definitely worth getting early. I mean, what's the last one you just did? It was an Undying King by John French. Uh, oh, so that Hollow King is what, what his would have been. Yeah, and then right. we also just did uh, The Hunter's Quarry, um, which hasn't been released yet because I'm being lazy, haven't, uh, haven't edited it yet, but that's coming out soon. Anyways, Pocket Realms, tons of fun. Check those out. Uh, and then guess what? It, if you can't or just flat out don't want to support the Patreon, I don't blame it. it I wouldn't either. Um <laughs> I that's don't. fine I mean, uh you can head over to your podcast service of choice and go ahead and just give us a review whether it's on apple or spotify or you pick there's like a million a million of them out there but just give it a little review give it a little star rating um to help you know get get our name out there and you could even do one better and tell a friend um maybe a friend that you don't like all that much uh to go ahead and listen to the mortal <laughs> realms a friend that hates puns specifically hates puns yeah really stick it to him or her really get them good <laughs> um all right fine that's all i wanted to get out of the way uh i look forward to you uh reviewing the numbers and seeing that instead of everybody not making it to the end nobody makes it past the past <laughs> 12 minute mark <laughs> i think we still count those though i think we still count them um <laughs> <laughs> so there's that all right uh let's do what we all or everybody came here for it's the, it's the story phase paul would you would you take us away the story phase in the story phase we delve into the stories characters creatures and environments of the nine realms we sure do all right so uh we're gonna start the way we always start which is my favorite segment I'm the only one who likes it, but that, oh, crap. But I'm the one who makes the notes, so that's all that matters. Um, I want to know more about these Sylvaneth, and I want you guys to help me out, help me understand by giving me your best one-sentence explanation of what the faction or the race or whatever term you want to use for what these Sylvaneth are. Uh, for the person who's never heard of Sylvaneth, and maybe this is the first episode of The Moral Realms that they've ever listened to. So I want off-the-cuff, unprepped, one-sentence description. We're going to go in the same order, Paul. Please tell me what the Sylvaneth are. Magically invested, sometimes vindictive, tree spirit slash other spirits, combinations that defend the natural realms of the mortal realm. That had like a beat poetry tempo to it. Yeah. Like I felt like I had a... Um, I wonder if I would have typed that all out, how many blue squiggle lines would I have gotten un- under it? <laughs> Microsoft Word. Not red. I would have typed in red. The words are words, but yeah, the blue ones. Um, all right. It, that'll be tough to follow up. But Davey, uh, if you'd be so kind as to give us your rendition of your one sentence Sylvaneth explanation. Wrathful woodland spirits tied to the cycles of the natural order. Oh, succinct, tight. That's uh, so much better than mine. No, no, everybody, just each have their own metrics, or not metrics, um, their own meters. What's also meters. I'd, I'd let you know if it was better. I would, I would be like, <laughs> you'd be the I'd first person that he would tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not shy. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, uh, last but definitely not least, please give me your one sentence explanation of the Sylvan. I feel like there's still so much more to know. Yeah. Uh, the forests have no need for a Lorax because the trees will speak for themselves. And they're very angry about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all around. Oh, man. <laughs> great. I'm going to do a really quick aside. Uh, my daughter was really into uh, the Lorax. Uh, and we kept getting out from the library. Uh, this is, she was probably three years old. And then I finally, one Christmas, got it for her. And we always do hints on the, on the uh, tags. And so I said it was from mom, dad, and the Onceler. And she was like, <gasps> The Onceler. The Onceler <laughs> sent me a present. <laughs> like, oh, no, I mean, it's like, a, no, that's it's actually what happened. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I feel like I learned so much from your one sentence um, explanations. But uh, if you guys want, if you want to keep going, we can definitely keep, if you prefer, we can talk more about the, the Sylvaneth. Um, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. I just wanted a response. I really appreciate it. I appreciate You're just planting that seed so we can make it grow. Playing to the crowd. All right. So, um, we got we got to start with where they came from. What's the origin? From whence did the Sylvaneth spring? And this is fun because they literally do kind of spring up to some degree. Um, what are the origins of the Sylvaneth? Does anybody have any thoughts or, or places they want to start from? Uh, you know, from the beginning, which is a very good place to start. So they, one thing that was interesting to me is that it didn't seem to be that they existed prior to Alarial arriving. Um, it, it seemed like her arrival is she was like, man, I miss having peeps around me in the forest. And so she, 
uh, had some some spirits that she brought with her and, and planted the soul seeds. So uh, the the realms existed. The Sylvaneth, who you might have expected to, you know, be able to lay some claim to being as old as the realms themselves, like it they they frequently feature as being very ancient um, lineages stretching back a long time, which they do, you know, into the age of myth. But uh, specifically here. They, they were uh, created by Alariel uh, once she was awakened in the mortal realms and primarily in a particular realm. Yeah, it's it's noteworthy because given that she's one of a handful of like what ends up being elven gods and so many of the elven gods had to go hunting for their people where like she's the exception. She flat out just made she made friends. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of making friends, but this is ridiculous. Um, and uh, <laughs> so the idea that she had to plant those. Um, I like the shovel motion you did. Yeah. See, this is why we have the video. The video is important. It's clutch. <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah, being able to cre- create them, it really is in stark contrast to some of the other um elven uh you know histories and stories and but let, let's this is an interesting point like that Illyriel is an elven about. goddess but the sylvaneth are not elves they're tree spirits they're you know spites um and so while Illyriel did plant the soul pods that started the sylvaneth race parts of what the sylvaneth are defined by did actually make the journey themselves Alariel came, then the Oak of Ages also came from the Old World. And then one of the new units that we've gotten, uh, Dragon Spites, actually were eggs within the Oak of Ages that came across from the Old World as well. So um, the Sylvaneth themselves didn't, but portions of who they became and what we're seeing now come to fruition did come from the Old World independently. I wonder why she didn't and just... Now, because I'm still thinking about my own points, because that's all I care about, um, is why why wasn't she looking for elves, right? Like it, it's mm-hmm. w- it's uh, why didn't she have that attachment? Because she, I mean, to some degree, she was on this like equal foot. She was pals with like Tyrion and Teclas. I mean, or maybe yep. even more so at some point. Like it, what? Why was there such such a stark difference in terms of their perspective? I don't think they even go into it in particular. I guess mm-hmm. it just serves the story. Sylvaneth needed to be Sylvaneth, and mm-hmm. Lumineth needed to be Lumineth. I guess, but. Um, yeah. Uh, I would, I'd well, be curious to know why. Did she become antisocial? Like, she only liked the mm-hmm. trees? Maybe. That, that we do get some mentions of wanderers in this battle tome, but she's not mentioned as the goddess of the wanderers, except they betrayed her, so therefore she's no longer paying attention to them. Right? Like, yeah. that's almost incidental. The actual elves are almost incidental to the, the main story of this battle tome, which is cool yeah yeah unless you're a big elf fan and then it's very uncool um so uh, uh lariel shows up she plants some soul pods sylvaneth sprout out i think we're we're i think we're, we're we're setting the timeline in motion we're moving forward we're advancing so i think we should probably start talking about the age of myth if it was, wasn't clear that's when she was showing up and planting these soul pods back in their very very early days of uh age of myth um so beyond that uh essentially what, what did the age of myth look like for the Sylvaneth? How did they spend their time? What were they doing back then? Well, what was, you know, their world like? Um, does anybody have some initial thoughts or maybe some stories to back up their initial thoughts too? Uh, what do you guys think? Initially, they like seem pretty chill, like living in, in the forests. Uh, I mentioned Zalariel was like happy to be a part of Sigmar's pantheon. And the crack showed up before the Age of Chaos because the like all of the mortals setting up their cities during the age of myth were like, Oh, cool. A forest. I'd love to tear this down and build a city. And so even, even before chaos even first turned its face, Alario mm-hmm. was probably one of the first of the gods of order to like kind of push back against Sigmar. Yeah. Rightfully so. Right. Like, Oh, hold, hold, hold up. You, you stay over there. I'll stay over here. Let's not. Yeah. There was, there was a uh, mention along these lines, uh, which I appreciated because I've, I've never really, I, I don't think I've seen it put in these terms before, like acknowledging, usually it's like uh, followers of Sigmar or humans somewhere, like you know, cut down too much wood, use too much uh, of the forest for firewood or, you know, despoiled it in some way and they, they got revenged upon. Uh, what I liked here was that it did acknowledge like some of the, some of the retribution was like out of, uh, like it was an order of magnitude greater than the initial slight and that like created this, created this rift, like or, or um, heightened this rift, where where some of these folks who might have seen 
the forest as like, oh, this is a thing to live in harmony with. They saw it as like, this is the scary place. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I liked that, you know, and that is also something that was established all the way back in the age of myth. It wasn't like a recent development. Right. Um, so some of the, the goals of the time, right, there's that they were out there protecting some of these natural places um, with fonts of life magic. And so they'd spread pretty thoroughly throughout uh, Gairan, but it turns out they are also spreading throughout the realms too, right? They, they weren't held or restrained to just living in the um, realm of life, but rather they'd venture out into other parts of the realms that also had fonts of life magic. And so they really were, this is a, a time of expansion is the impression I was getting um, as mm -hmm. well. And they had the, um, and we can talk more about the song eventually, but although they expanded out wi wi widely and wildly, I suppose, um, they are always connected back home to Gairan through this, this um, spirit song that they're singing amongst themselves. But uh, it really was kind of, I mean, in some ways their, their heyday um, and that is, as long they were, it's kind of like an unchecked expansion to some degree, where they could, you know, wherever you were going to find forests, you were probably going to find Sylvaneth coming out there to to protect them across the realms. And it, it is interesting to me because most of the books start out with this is what happens when the god was shown, and that's the first thing that happens, right? Yep. In this one, for the relic of ages past in the age of myth, the first thing that happens is the oak of ages past shows up, and then the second entry, centuries later. Illyriel is welcomed by Sigmar during his journey across the realms in the awakening of the Ever Queen. And it's almost as if um, I had a question of whether or not Illyriel is changing the realms to be more of what she wants to be, or if she's more devoted towards nurturing what exists in the realms. Because one of the things that's a little bit constant in this battle tome is that when she has control when her glades have control over parts of the realms, they start to have more seasons than the normal realms in general. There's only four seasons for the normal realms, but when the Sylvan are super active, there's like seven or eight. So it was interesting because it almost seemed a little bit like the Sylvan might be a little bit like an invasive species that are changing their world to be what they want it to be. As opposed to I had, that, I had that same thought, the invasive species. <laughs> yeah. And that's not a thought I'd had before. So that was a, a different way of looking at it that I got from this battle tome. Well, and, it, and if that were to be the case, if it, rather they were trying, she was intentionally changing the realms in her own image. Uh, is that all that different than what many of the other gods have been doing that we described mm -hmm. like, you know, evil intent or something like that, which is a really good uh, thought. And I think it'll probably come up more when we talk about the right of life li later. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I'll ask, uh, do, do you folks have uh, any stories that jumped out at you uh, from this age that that you guys want to talk about that you found interesting at all? Uh, one story I really enjoyed was the Ever Queen's Benevolence. Yes. Um, I, I love this. So the story is Bayamat, uh, the father of Gargans, Sigmar bopped him on the head uh, and he he's knocked out. And I guess Alariel, for some reason, gets to decide what happens to him. Since he's been have like he was messing up her home turf, yeah, and she decides to like let him and his peeps just kind of hang out and chill uh, while he takes his his long nap, and so the gargans actually like respect her, like they call her the woman of the woods, yeah. And it says like, oh, they tried really hard not to knock over trees. They didn't succeed, but they tried. <laughs> <laughs> the more the more traditionally minded gargans, I really like the idea of yeah you know, uh, deference being paid. That's cool. Yeah. I, I really love that, that it's like connecting to a faction from a different grand order. That's not immediately not grand or grand Alliance. That's not immediately hostile, uh, kind of showing more interconnectivity in the, the realms. I would love to see an, an, um, an army of Gargans converted to like respect the woman of the woods. So like a bunch of Sylvanus parts or like put a bunch of like tree men stuff, like make them like a yeah. gargant tree man, like hybrid sure. or something like that would be kind of neat. Um, but they wouldn't take any of the tree parts. Cause then the, they mm. would think that she'd get them <laughs> or they're in, dis they're under in disguise though. Right. And maybe she oh, right. they could blend in. <laughs> like <laughs> Now I'm thinking me, tree men me one tree man. and then uh, gargants as spite, massive spite revenants. That would be pretty sweet. 
paint them in that like in that ghost like color like the spirit like mm-hmm. color scheme so like have the their fleshy parts coming out of the wood tree men parts but like just yeah. paint it like the flesh like that'd be cool. oh, that's not a bad idea and i hate conversions um i think that's <laughs> the story highlights one of the beautiful one of the beauty of beautiful the neat parts of uh the age of myth right is because a lot of people are just friends back then like that's part of yeah. and maybe they have rose tinted gla- glasses maybe it, it wasn't all hunky dory as it seems but like in some ways it's very this mythological time where you know dogs and cats were playing with each other and uh sylvaneth and gargants were were pals um I, mass hysteria i wish we could <laughs> yeah i wish we could spend more time back there uh it sounded like you had a story davy yeah well speaking of friends i i like the sewing of peace uh uh-huh. this is a story about uh, Alariel and her Sylvaneth uh, going between realms and finding these uh, sort of wellsprings of life magic. And uh, as in, in the process, you know, it says like her, her uh, power remains in Gyran, but while she is there, uh, it makes note that she was not solely worshiped by Sylvaneth, but also by root dwelling Dwarden clans, kin bands of elven rangers, druidic human kingdoms and knightly orders. Um, and, I like thinking about those other those sort of other allied factions and what you might do, and I really like it because I I have a soft spot in my heart for the idea of the uh, uh, was it the root wardens mm-hmm. we read about forever ago, never actually seen them, but we've seen their holds back in a, a Josh Reynolds yep. uh, joint. So um, I I liked that uh, I liked the idea like those felt all like hey here's jumping off points um, for. Uh, doing something tangentially related to these Sylvaneth. Uh, and great if you were doing like a doubles or, or something thematic, like, hey, my guys are particularly allied to Sylvaneth. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned the the Josh Reynolds story because I think one of like the main characters we follow in that story is one of the Knightly Orders. <laughs> yep, yeah, um, totally. So we've, get, we've got a two-for-one special. And I don't even think <laughs> that book, like the section of that book took pl- place in Gairan. So it's not just there; no. it's kind of all over. It was this kind of this a is the uh, the yeah. uh, eight lamentations? Yeah, mm-hmm. spear shadows. Yeah, yeah. Right. but then there was then another that short story um, featuring the apps. same character. Yep. Yeah. Oosh. We got bats. Drop them all day long. Um, <laughs> yeah, right on. Because one uh, additional thought when I was talking about how the Sylvaneth were sort of spreading out through all the other realms, it's worth noting, though, that they aren't necessarily all lockstep and a uh, unified front. As they sort of spread out and develop their own cultures, there was a little bit of like a fracturization, is that a word, um, amongst the Sylvaneth. <laughs> and they started to um, uh, maybe distrust those um, uh, glades that like ventured off to different realms. And like as they had their own customs and, like I said, cultures, um, like some some core component of Sylvaneth are, are inherently uh, traditionalists. And so seeing folks go off and do different, do their own thing in those different realms sort of uh, separated them. And there's different schisms, despite the fact that they all nominally were underneath, um, you know, Alarial's rule, which was, I thought, noteworthy. They're not um, well, a, a singular voting block per se, um, which I thought was cool. Um, if they're not a singular voting block, would you say that, some of these factions have splintered off into their own. <laughs> oh, it was right there. It was right there, and I didn't even take it. Um, yes, I would. I would say that all day and all night. Um, well, it, it it takes a lot for me to, to say this, but that was good. I it, it's more never funny because yeah. I thought of it at the beginning of what he was saying, and then I'm like, oh, I missed it, and then it, he circled back to letting me do it again. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> That's why. That's why we are. That's why we're all here. It's a joint effort. It's a team. It's a team sport. Podcasting. Um, mm. All right. Any other age of myth thoughts? Because then we're going to move right on to that age of chaos. Um, I was going to say everyone's favorite age. That's not true. Hmm. In fact, it's probably not Sylvan's favorite age. Um, <laughs> all right. Age chaos is here. End scene. Start new one. Um, what uh, What does the age of chaos mean? For the Sylvaneth, how, how, how does it affect them? How do their lives change for the better, for the worse? Probably not the better. Um, and um, what what is what does that age look like for them? Anybody got any thoughts? I mean, it's the the big time. the The signature event is the War of Life, and this is mm-hmm. uh, Nurgle being attracted slash uh, offended by this particular way of uh, things being verdant. And uh, you know, we've, I, we've talked about this before for sure, but this, there's that duality. Like there's so much talk of cycles in this book and there's so much talk of cycles in Nurgle, uh, lore. So they are natural opponents. And this is when we first discovered age of Sigmar. Uh, this was, this was something we spent a ton of time in was, uh, Gyran 
with Nurgle having gained ascendancy. Uh, so, you know, the, it's it's kind of the not only is it a a uh, cornerstone of this faction, but it's it's kind of a cornerstone of the setting of Age of Sigmar is the War of Life. Nurgle going into Gyran, uh, still having a, a large presence there. Uh, and still really messing up a lot of their naming conventions, um, <laughs> which, I mean, by the way, like, uh, apparently there was a, a region named Decrepita. It was called that before <laughs> the Age of Chaos. It's like, ooh, ooh, really set yourself up there. <laughs> Bummer. Mm-hmm. You're asking uh, for it. Yeah. Uh, this specifically, the War of Life, though, like one small piece is they specifically mentioned Chaos Dwarden hacking apart uh, Axian Sylvaneth. Uh, for magically resonant kindling in their soul forges, which whoo, spicy okay. little bit of information. No, yeah, thank you. it's like what would a soul forge be, right? Like, what is that? Sounds interesting. No, I, I, absolutely. I uh, I thought it was noteworthy, and I'm trying to harken back to him when we read the Nurgle um, battle tome, which was honestly not that long ago. Uh, that one, one of my favorite parts of looking through or reading through these books is for those armies that are like inherent to given realms. They often talk about like how a given realm specifically felt a chaos and like why it felt a chaos and the things that led up to it. And there's a lot of like great, like age of myth to age of chaos, like transitional stories, like, Oh, it was like this. And then this is why it fell. I didn't really get that sense in this, uh, book in that it was very much, Oh, chaos showed up and Nurgle attacked Gyran. like sure i understand why nurgle was attracted to it but like in in hish it's like this interesting story about the uh, okari dara or you know the spire fall mm-hmm. or like at least in um ulgu it's like that interesting well silver or uh, slanesh or the slanesh followers thought that slanesh was there and it, and it drove them to like go and find them I, I think those are like interesting story hooks but i didn't get a great hook here it just was like oh there he is they rolled up. There's Nurgle. Yeah. Well, like in Shaman, we have the Lode Griffin, right? There's an event that's just like, oh, everything is pulled out of place and like everything yeah. is terrible now. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah, we just don't have that in, in this battle tome or in this story, um, which is interesting, mm-hmm. I think, because it's a, it's a notable exception. I was going to say, like, it, they have the one small section, and I think it's not like the most exciting story about how it happened, but I think it is. Uh, a very telling story, just like Davy was saying that like there's a lot of similarities between Alariel and Nurgle. I think like that the story, the first hole of doom, it it's a, he's an infection that's slowly spreading. People are worshiping the harvest. They're worshiping new life. Someone shows up with a slightly different take on it. People start joining that guy and it, it just slowly spread. So then when the age of chaos happened, uh, they just all sort of pounced. But I think it hints at there being this kind of like low level, very slow growth happen. Yeah. Which, yeah, that makes sense. And, 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 Oftentimes the gateway to have chaos enter your realm is through like the mortals and like how uh, uh, they're the entry point essentially. And I suppose this book isn't about those people and thus it doesn't yeah. spend too much time on that transition. The Silmaneth are in some ways sort of victims of that, necess- not necessarily the causes, unlike the Lumineth who kind of cause yeah. their own you know issues and things of that nature. So no, I, I get that for sure. Yeah. And then you speak of that um, slow roll, like uh, <laughs> Nurgle um, uh, worshiper, you know, transition. There's a Strachan uh, short story, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's perfect, and it's so good, and it's just about something like that. While you're pulling that up, uh, you mentioned that the Sylvaneth were kind of the victims of the choice of mortals, which has kind of been a lot of the theme about Alariel's relationship with the rest of the Order Pantheon. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. And, and furthermore, like, if you were a mortal living in, you know, Gyran or something like that in the Age of Myth, and although there's you're kind of allies with the Sylvaneth, if you were terrified of the woods, like... And you, thus, you were probably going to be and, and, and terrified of the things that lived there. You'd probably be terrified of that goddess that like controls yeah. those things. And can you blame someone for not wanting to necessarily like uh, align yourself with that and rather turn to some other, you know, force that, you know, maybe protects you or like something that at least somebody who seems to like you better? And yeah. Papa, Papa Nurgle loves you, right? Like, um, so in some <laughs> ways, can you blame them for falling into the arms of uh um, Nurgle. Uh, it's the growing seasons, I believe, is mm. the um, is the horror short and the invocations anthology. It's 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 oh, okay. very very similar to that sort of transitional tale. It's very good. So, uh, all right, so we're in the age of chaos. Things are going to heck. Um, Gyran's getting overrun by Nurgle. Did you guys have any stories from this time frame that uh, grabbed you that you want to talk about? Well, I like the waning um, because 
not because it's like super optimistic, it's super pessimistic. Olariel is just like not present and everything is getting sacked, including the Oak of Ages past. Um, but I like the fact that they've mentioned ancient glades such as Hawthorne, Fronkin, and Eiderbracht are eradicated. Their soul pod groves set ablaze. And I was like, that would be a really interesting story hook if you were to go and try and reclaim those soul pod groves, right? Like to try and rekindle those uh no, don't don't kindle them. No wrong E. Don't <laughs> That was the problem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're just starting it all over again. So I, yeah, I'd I'd like to know what those are about. Like I would love a story of like what the Frankin or the Eiderbracht or the Hawthorne were. Because uh, it seems cool, right? More stories. What do you got for me? I like the Battle of Tears. I don't know. Like, the best one. That's yeah, why I definitely no, gotta cover that. Yeah, Battle of Tears, which I love because it, it's you know, it, it sets up this ridiculous battle getting ready to happen uh, in Kurnoth's area, Kurnothiel. And Kurnoth shows up. Like, I, one of the very few confirmed sightings of the god Kurnoth. Mm. And then they pull a Hobbit novel move and be like, no <laughs> one has any details about how the battle went. Anyway, that guy's dead. Uh, moving on. Um, <laughs> one one uh, dryad. A dryad survived. Yeah, one dryad. So. Well, and it's telling, I think there are like three main things that this story sets up for the future. Uh, the first is, you know, we hear Kurnoth is slain. We hear he's slain. We don't see he's slain. I don't see nobody. Yeah. The those Kurnathi elves that we've seen in the underworlds and even Curse City yep. sort of disappear and retreat. And then the fact that we aren't told what happens means that we may eventually be told what happens, which I think is uh very very much foreshadowing something in the future. I haven't read the other Sylvan of Battle of Tomes close enough. I, I think I did read the first one um, to remember if this story was detailed in those books or if this is like an incremental growing of the tale. I know, I mean, I knew we knew a little bit about Kurnoth's fate before, but I didn't know if, if they had gone to any level of detail yeah. or this level of detail before. So I can't say. Um, but the fact that, uh, that they're talking about it at all um, makes me think that there's it, it potentially is hints of things to come. So fingers crossed. Um, and we'll, we'll, I think we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. Um, but I will say also that that lone dryad who survived um, also had gotten um, the spear of Kurnos um, out of there. And that's actually what Illyrio wields to this day. So um, fortunately, uh, or it's fortunate that, that dry, dryad survives with the spear could continue uh Spearing people, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. Which is pretty neat. He's inspirational. Yeah, you, 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 <laughs> ain't, you ain't wrong. Um, other stories that folks want to talk about? I think it covers it for me. That was kind of, there's a lot of lot of history here. Um, much of it we kind of already know. Yeah, mm-hmm. agreed. Uh, I'll say one thing that jumped out at me was the uh, Shrouded season. And so this one I do know was in, was in previous uh, Battle Thomas, but the fact that like um, Illyrio, during the Age of Chaos, Illyrio's particularly despondent. And so uh, in doing so, she raises up um, or starts planting soul pods from which these outcasts start um, prop- popping up. And so these are like warped and twisted Sylvaneth uh, souls. And no one exactly knows like why they are the way they are, um, especially because uh, everyone who has any memory of this time, their memories have been wiped. Um, and so no one can literally, it's called shrouded season because the, the memories of this time are, are shrouded in, uh, you know, f- f- mental fog. And so um, obviously something weird must have gone down for them to have had their memories wiped, presumably by Illyrial or some forces, you know, loyal to Illyrial to make sure that nobody can recall how this happened. But it's from this time that the out- outcasts have sprung up. And we'll, I think, probably talk about the outcasts a little bit more um, later. That, that might be a good point to bring up uh, the Lamentiri, which is a unique thing about the Sylvaneth. Sure, yeah, go ahead. The, the Lamentiri are basically, they are books, but they're not books, uh, but they contain Book is the book. history of the Sylvaneth <laughs> race, and they are objects that are on um, certain Sylvaneth that tell you everything that there is. So, like, the fact that there is a part of the Sylvaneth race that is unknown, 
when these lemon teary have been passed down from dryad to, or not from dryad, but from like tree lord to tree lord, like all this history has been preserved, really speaks to something terrible happening, right? Or something exceptional that all of the lemon teary don't know what happened, don't know what's going on, right? Um, and again, I, I keep going back to the fact that she's an elven goddess, but she was not one of the goddesses or the gods that helped to pull souls out of Slanesh because that was Tyrion and Teclis and Marathi and Malekith now Malarian. Now Malarian. Um, so it, yeah, I'm wondering where that could have come from. Like, could she possibly have pulled some tainted souls from Slanesh as well? And then not knowing it, and perhaps that these that's what these outcasts are, or like these tainted souls or something. Who knows? Like we don't have an explanation, so it's completely up for conjecture. So that's that's kind of fun. And that's Paul's MO. That is my wheelhouse. Conjecture. Like, <laughs> one, two, three, conjecture avenue. <laughs> Gonna I got my schoolhouse rock. Two, conjecture avenue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then we take it higher. You owe me a dollar. Damn it. That's all right. Paul's tab is outrageously high. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it. Down. I'm bringing it down now by one dollar. All right. So it's uh, around this time. Um, you know, through, kind of during the war of life. Um, Alario gets so despondent. There's so many defeats. Um, she, her forces are being defeated left and right that um, she has to eventually retreat and to head head to the uh, Ethel Weird. It's a word, um, uh, which is like the sub, like, it's like a sub realm. It's hidden. It's, it's like a place of respite for her, um, where she essentially is just going to wait out the inevitability of the defeat and the overrunning of Gyran, a very defeatist attitude. And I mean, to some degree, it's her life, you know, her, her forces and her power is, is, are seasonal and cyclical. And so like, she's just, she's gonna, she's gonna t- take a load off. She's gonna re- rest this one out. Um, and yeah, so things aren't looking great at the end of, end of the Age of Chaos, or it's not even apparent that it's at the end of the Age of Chaos, but we know better because what comes next? Well, so the opening story of the Age of Sigmar is Azir opens, and this is Realmgate Wars. Lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt. Exactly. <laughs> um, and you know what happens when lightning bolts hit trees? Bad things happen. So, uh, oh no. When, <laughs> when um, the storm host of the Hallowed Knights come in to try and meet with Alariel, they accidentally lead Nurgle into the Ethel Weird. And the sight of the Ethel Weird being corrupted causes Alariel to despair to the point where she ceases to be conscious. I don't know that I ever understood that it was completely just like, literally, you know, like talk about seasonal depression. Like this is a, a <laughs> perfect example of like going into your shell and nothing can happen. She real sad. Um, She's one but, of those lights. Um, exactly. Uh, so we have the Lady of Vines becomes our agent right now. Um, the goddess is completely immobile, completely despondent, and the Lady of Vines um, decides to protect her and is the thing that keeps the Sylvaneth going, right? So this is the first time that we have a god being rescued by one of her creations, uh, which is a fun little twist on the normal way that we have it. Nagash okay. was saved by his Mortarks, wh- whom he cr- directly created, if I understand correctly. It's almost yeah, a, but that's, a direct parallel in some ways. But it, was, like, it wasn't like Vlad went and rescued him. It's because they all have horcruxes, you know, to, to use a common parlance. Uh, so can't first of all, Vlad's not here. Second of all, <laughs> I disagree. Yeah, um, uh, but we, I don't. We don't need to spend time on it. Um, so it, it would definitely interesting. Keep going if you want. I, I respect your uh, correction, and I will accept it. Good. <laughs> and it's oh, been good. documented <laughs> and submitted to the corrections department. Um, yeah. So uh, the Lady of Vines. Uh, is shepherding this I'm trying to think I, I mean we can spend more t- time well we, we might as well though i will say listeners if you want to know the ins and outs of the war of life i do believe like one of the first four episodes of this their podcast was spent talking about a lot of those stories back then they featured heavily in the realm gate wars so we, yeah. we actually spent quite a bit talking about it david did you ever think well t- 2015 2016 maybe that in in the year of our lord 2022 you'd still be talking about the war of life uh about the ages in the, the beginning of Age of Sigmar. That's reflect. I really hoped not, but here I am. I, I've got a better question. 
Did you think that we would see a miniature introduced in the War of Life come to fruition in 2022? Because that was a cool callback. Yeah. Uh, I, no is the answer to that. I, I would have <laughs> thought if they were going to make it, uh, they would have made it quite a while ago. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree. It was. It, it, you know, we can talk about her now, but it's kind of a cool throwback to folks who've been... Uh, when, when she popped up, it even took me a second. I was like, wait, I know this person, right? Like mm-hmm. from many years ago, she was, she was in some of the first stories and I had to double check my, you know, cause sometimes some of these names can blend together a little bit. I was like, maybe mm-hmm. I'm just conflating something. And I was like, no, no, that's her. That's cool. So yeah. yeah. Right. I might say that, uh, the lady of vines is Larry L's left-hand woman. I would never, I, I would never I might say not. that. <laughs> no. Yeah. I've, because she yeah. literally cuts off her left hand to make no, her. No, we get it. Yeah. No, we, we. It's not that we didn't understand. <laughs> we don't have to allow to understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Shepard's uh, Alariel, uh, they're, they're on the run from Nurgle for a long time. Um, and what what spurs her to like rise from her wrath? What it, They uh, specifically are bringing her to a, a place to uh, plant her, like a site of one of the rare victories from the the war of life yeah. uh paul do you remember the name of this it's called the blackstone summit blackstone summit right, and right. uh the lady of vines sacrifices she gets uh knocked down by torglug the despised uh aka tornus the redeemed um but she got up again and she, they're never gonna keep her down was, never gonna keep her down uh that that is the start you know she she dies many times uh moving forward uh, each time coming back taller um Sounds like she she grows back stronger every time because uh, Ilario keeps bringing her back. But the first time she brings her back, it's like Paul was saying, Ilario cuts off her own hand, throws it down, grows into the Lady of Vines again, and uh, then Ilario regenerates her hand. Well, my understanding is every time Ilario has to cut off her left hand, like it's just a constant thing. Every time she dies, yeah. oh, got to <laughs> cut off my left hand again. <laughs> Dude, dude, a little more careful. This sucks for me, you know? Like, exactly. <laughs> you stop dying so much. Like, this is not helpful. You know, so um, my wife's a pretty big gardener, and she she's ruthless, and she'll prune all sorts of stuff back way, far, way farther than I think it first seems like it's, you know, <laughs> responsible. Uh, but like the Lady of Vines, when, whenever she does so, the, the plants come back bigger and stronger and taller. And so, like, in some ways, she's just getting pruned repeatedly and um, growing bushier, I suppose. Well, and... And what I love about this story is that we got the the sweet Alariel miniature when this story came out. Because up until this point, I think we still had the metal Alariel miniature with the butterfly wings. Yeah. That'd be Ariel, right? Um, Ariel. And Alariel recently got a plastic mini before she was a goddess when the High Elf Ranch came out in 8th edition. Oh, yeah. She got with the hearts. There's a bunch of hearts or something, right? Well, so her... There's a handmaiden yeah, and then... A handmaiden the and the hearts she had. Yeah, okay. But yeah, like this was a, a um, awesome glow up um, of the model. To say the least, yeah. Uh, so, it, and it represented that the fact that she had gone to her war aspect, which is... It's a cool thing that we haven't seen. We haven't seen these cycles in other gods. We've just seen different miniatures representing who they are. Um, but this is an actual evolution of the character. Which is fun. Uh, with the Lady of Vines, I really want to see what happens when she finds out that Sigmar took the the Nurgle warrior that killed her and then made him a Stormcast. Mm. Mm-hmm. I want to see them bump into each other. Well, and you say that. It, the fact that they're willing to make characters back from that time frame makes yeah. me... Mm-hmm. Well, they did it once. Why can't they do it multiple times? And you got to wonder... Is Torglug on? The, is Torglug on the modeling table right now? Like, is, is someone is someone right now while we speak at this very moment modeling up Torglug in some like CAD program? Um, and by that I mean Tornus. Probably not Torglug. Uh, I was gonna how say, cool would that be? yeah, maybe not Torglug. <laughs> yeah. Tornus, Tornus' story takes an unexpected turn. He goes back. You know, People it's not impossible. Him. I mean, not impossible. Like, good. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I do like that Age of Sigmar has been around just long enough that they can start referencing itself instead of having to constantly reference the old world. Throwbacks. Yeah, that's awesome. We don't have to go back to the old world to get historical characters. We can actually go back to the the Realm Gate Wars, which is super fun. And yet, we'll um, probably still go back to the old world too, though. I mean, yeah, that's but, true. Okay. Uh, I would say uh, as we continue this uh, sprawling aside that. Uh, <laughs> 
noted. It's almost a thing where the because there is so much history of AOS now, and then when you take one of these factions, which has been around since the start, which was like very, very much present at the at the beginnings of Age of Sigmar, uh, then you end up with these these uh, sections where it goes through. Here's the history of this faction. Uh, one of my favorite things to do in these is to get those little bites, these little tastes of like here's here's a uh, here here's a, a story seed for you to think about. Uh, they have to give more and more time over to history of of this, and so there's there's a fair amount of this uh, going through the age of uh, myth, chaos, Sigmar, and forward, where it's covering. It says, "Hey, like if you just picked up this book, we kind of got to let you know what the actual history of this faction is." And for folks like me who've you know been been around it for a long time, as we've established. Um, there's not as much new and, and fun stuff for me there. So um, not that there was nothing. It was just, I noticed like, oh yeah, you know, I start to read a section. I'm like, yeah, I kind of already know this stuff. All right, next one, mm. next one, next one. And that'll be a comment when we get to like at the end of the battle tome. That, that's definitely a comment that I have as well, that we have these different kind of battle tomes that we have now. Some of them get like a massive redo. Some of them get a small redo. Some of them get an update. Um, and this one kind of falls in the middle. So it will be interesting when we get to the end to see where everybody kind of falls on that. If we get that far. Hmm. I enjoyed A Pact of Bark and Steel, um, which is a dispossessed throng led by King Dorgo Bronzemane. Uh, but in Shimon, but it talks about how there are ironbark Silaneth, um, and they have metal. They incorporate metal into their, um, their bark and stuff like that. They actually have some silveriness, uh, etc., uh, but they're both fighting against um, Moon Clan that have figured out how to grow loon cap mushrooms, which is super fun. So and I, I just knew that it was it was a fun little aside. The ally was somebody they're not usually allied with, and the third party is kind of fun. But some of them escape, so you know maybe that'll be a story point going forward. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, it specifically gives them a reason that like they remain allied in the hopes of like tracking down the remainder of these uh grots who have special fungus growing knowledge now yeah very cool um so uh lariel is reborn in a war aspect uh she again the uh, it seems as if the the forces of order aren't aren't necessarily as on the back foot as they used to be with the addition of the stormcast eternals and so they're able to fight back and try and regain ground uh in the world um it's around this time that the seeds of hope are established we talked about those before i think on plenty of episodes but the idea that there's these cities of sigmar that are um founded in Gairan with the help and sort of blessing oftentimes from Ilarial. One such thing, the li- living city is literally made by Ilarial in one night and some allies of hers as well. Um, and so it's, uh, it, it's sort of cements the, um, the allyship, I guess, um, uh, yeah. between those two, um, two forces, which is not to say that it's a, com- a perfect friendship. Um, a lot of the old issues that er- had arisen in the Age of Myth between your mortals and the, and the Sylvanet, they still occasionally happen. Greywater Fastness is a, is a very industrial uh, city, an industrial city that requires a lot of natural resources, which then finds themselves button their buttonheads against um, the Sylvanet of you know, the surrounding regions, such that uh, they you know, siege the city, and after you know, a, a long, bloody battle, uh, they reach an agreement where there's going to be one exit out of the gray water fastness the one one single path uh that the mortals can leave uh and if they um err from that path by a single step they will be i don't know slaughtered or who knows what um so it just goes to show that uh there's this um tenuous pact between the forces of um the order and it's better than nothing though right like they're, if they're able to even st- some ways stand allied against uh chaos then they're better than standing alone any other stories or thoughts from this time frame of like early age of sigmar that you guys want to talk about negative nope one two three all right well then what happened next this is essentially your eight your age of sigmar 1.0 let's move it on to the 2.0 with the hallmark event of the necroquake um and Nash, Nagash getting uppity um messing with the world uh, realms turning things on their head literally sometimes the realms an uh, on their head in Shayish. Um, what does uh, this time frame mean for uh, the Sylvaneth? And did you guys have any stories from this time frame that uh, grabbed you and shook you? Uh, so Soul Wars, era, this, this one didn't grab me, but I think it's important to 
kind of understand some of the broader relationships that are uh, happening. So there's the morbid advent, um, and this is the necroquake. One of the side effects of the necroquake, as we know, is that it revealed uh, the storm vaults. Uh, it kind of disrupted those, was it penumbral engines? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And uh, this is the thing where Alario is like, hold on, you had storm vaults with like super dangerous stuff hidden in my territory uh, this whole time. And like, I didn't know about it. And now that, you know, something unexpected happened, you know, no plan survives contact with the enemy. All of a sudden now I'm, I'm stuck with this situation where I have these storm vaults and they have these really dangerous things and they're in my land. And now I got to deal with this. Uh, and so this is a, this is a thing, you know, there's, there's, uh, this is Sigmar as an imperfect God, which we see a lot. Um, but some of the, some of the fallout from this, this is one of the, one of the few strong bonds from the former pantheon of order or not pantheon order from the former pantheon, Sigmar's pantheon that, that is still relatively strong and it is uh, tested by this. For sure, absolutely. You mentioned how not too much jumped out and grabbed you. In hindsight, I always thought it weird that that Sylvaneth or like Alariel didn't have more to say about like the Necroquake in like the, that time of tribulations, like while it was happening in the moment. And I will get to like you know maybe her reaction down the line a little bit that's coming up. But like in the thick of it, like you would think who would be the person who would most have issue with like what was going on with Nagash, and to some degree honestly didn't have that much to say about it or like didn't have all that much involvement any more so than any of the other like order factions per se. Right. Um, and I guess I didn't realize it in the moment, but looking back on it, I think that's odd. Like, I feel like that was a missed opportunity though. I suppose I know where it's going. Yeah. Um, and to the point it's telling, cause the, the next story is the, a lost enclave, which is about Shadespire, the, the mirrored city and how the necroquake, affected that. So it's telling like how little uh, the Sylvaneth reacted when the four person war band is like the biggest force against Nagash at this point. Yeah. <laughs> like our, all of the warriors against Nagash, all four of them. Sure. Yeah. Just, I mean, that, that's the closest they could come up or, you know, the most interesting, one of the most interesting stories they can talk about in this, uh, in this era. Any other stories from what's left uh, that anybody wants to talk about. Uh, I enjoyed the trespass not story, um, which is a story where uh, Stormcast from the sons of Gladius arrive at Alariel's court, seeking knowledge of ancient Gironite artifacts. And then they go to Decrepita, which is the place where um, Nagash and his undead have atta attacked in the past. And it talks about how, um, having endured multiple reforgings, the Lord Celestine Timus Wren, his mind has begun to fray, and now he fervently believes that only the God King may be entrusted with such tools, as in everything that is in these storm vaults. And so without seeking approval from his Lord Commander, Wren assembles a brotherhood of similarly damaged stormcasts and leads them into the hostile lands of Decrepita. Like, that's a cool story. I want to hear more about that story. These damaged storm casts that are going crazy. Let's let's hear about that because that sounds amazing. But then months later, a war grove led by none other than the keeper of the Dreadwood arrives in the Living City with all these powerful weapons and just kind of drops them in front of the storm keep, and then just heads out. It's like peace. We're done. So that w I, I really enjoyed that for how much story was not told. But you could figure it out or like come up with your own explanation for it. Yeah. That was super fun. Keeping you guessing. Well, and they're not reforged. So this is another instance where someone found a way to beat the reforging of Stormcast. Mm -hmm. Yep. They, they keep doing it. Why is it, they keep figuring it out? Yeah, yeah. we're we're just going to be finding pockets of Stormcast all over the realms. Like, fell and got buried by rocks, and he's just laying there waiting for someone to dig him out or something. Yeah, L living off of eating moss or stuff like off yeah. the bottom of rocks. <laughs> um, I remember when I was we were talking about the I think it was the Fire Slayer battle tome. I it was bemoaning how few like interesting little tidbit stories there were in in it. 
um, in that like that's half the fun is reading these timelines is you get some stuff that you know, but like they drop in all these like different story hooks or like, you know, glimpses or vignettes into things. Um, and so because of that, I feel like I, I need to talk about as many of them as I can just to justify uh, my dismay before in the previous episode. So for example, there's another one. Um, there's this rights of winter that uh, happened in the uh, time of tribulations type era where um, this, the winter, what is it, winter leaf, all right, we forget what they're called. Winterleaf. Um, it's a it's a faction of Sylvaneth. We'll talk more about them later, possibly. Uh, of of these these tree lords, Winterleaf, where they are um, at odds with uh, a bunch of beast claw raider ogres, right? And they're at each other's throats or whatever tree men have for throats. Uh, but throughout one of these battles that they're having, um, it turns out that uh, they um, they stir up uh, a pocket of night haunt. And I'm glossing over some stuff, but then the, the night haunt then become this third uh, adversary, and the ogres and the tree lords decide, you know what? Uh, the, the spooky ghosts are worse than either one of us, and so they actually team up. It's yet another example of unlikely allies um, uh, teaming up to fight off this greater threat. And so it's these obviously the night haunt had risen up because of Nagash's, um, you know, necroquake, and that's around when the night haunt showed up. Um, and they uh, were able to buy, f- fight off the night haunt. I think they start like freezing their spectral forms, which is pretty cool because they both um, have this affinity towards like cold, right? Hey, you wouldn't have guessed it, but Sylvaneth can be cold just like anything else um and it's uh they well, doesn't bother me anyway yeah, absolutely uh and um they are able to drive off the night haunt and they they grow to respect each other and they decide you know what i'll tell you what let's have a truce for like three seasons or something that like that which is going to give the ogres enough time to eat what they want and then get the heck out of here and uh no harm no foul catch you on the flip yeah. side and so that's the end of end of that so I thought, for, the, uh, I thought the antagonist in this story sounded pretty, pretty black metal. Arl Joff, chief of the frosts. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I love the scene. So it's, it's a great, it's a great example of like, um, like a specific setting, a very unique setting, um, mixing two factions that wouldn't necessarily cross, uh, all that common between the Sylvaneth and the Oers. And then like, they have this mutual respect at the end of it. Um, friends becoming enemies, enemies becoming friends. Um, you love to see it. So a very cool little story. So I had a couple uh, little notes that don't fit specifically in these stories, but are in some of the other um, stuff that we get earlier in the battle tome. Um, so the Necroquake doesn't have a name in the Sylvaneth battle tome. It's not like the the Garak Tornum like it was in the Caradon Overlords. Mm-hmm. And since it, it has such a massive deal, it was interesting that there is no name they give it. It's just like, oh, this is the Necroquake. Um, but it, it did cause some of the realm roots to shrivel and close. Mm. Which I think is fascinating because when Sylvaneth can't hear the realm roots, they slowly go insane. So we might have some insane glades out there that have not been connected back to the realm roots. Um, insane in the mem no- glades? Uh, no, I, uh, um, <laughs> is there something there? I, don't- I, I, I thought so. I thought it was great. Um, but then um, there's a little bit about how maybe Illyrial aided Teclis taking the gash down through his staff. Oh, yeah, uh, she true. was able to add power to Teclis from the staff that she gave him way back in the old world because she's yeah. just that cool. Wait, Teclis did what? Uh, I think that introduces uh, the next yeah, phase what? of our Age of Sigmar. And uh, let's, let's head into the, um, the, the Age of Beasts, the Broken Realms Age, the time, uh, that time frame. And I'm going to lead that off with a listener question. Ooh. Listener question, you might say. Maybe you've never listened to an episode of The, the Moral Realms and you think, whoa, ooh, I want to hear more about what a listener question is. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, dear listener, that's you, um, that if you wanted to get a question on this podcast where we would then answer it in our infinite wisdom, I'll tell you what you got to do. You got to go to <laughs> www.themoralrealms.com slash discord. Is that www.themoralrealms.com slash discord? Paul, you know it is. Uh, you hang out there all the time. You're going to want to anyways, um, because there's all, it's full of all sorts of interesting people, uh, like everybody here on this podcast, plus like countless, uh, hun- hundreds others uh, out there talking about everything you want to talk about, about the Age of Sigmar. But additionally, like a thief in the night, I will come uh, unannounced asking if anybody has any questions about uh, uh, upcoming what are these called story phase um and then <laughs> then you have the opportunity to ask ask any question that you would like and that we will talk about it here on the show um i have nothing else to add that's about it that sums it up like a thief in the night 
Aaron will also come take all your sealed boxes and your receipts. So watch out for that too. So what you need to do on that front actually is make sure you, as soon as you get a box, you need to open it immediately because I don't want it anymore if you do that. So <laughs> exactly. Um, God forbid you take something off the sprue. All right. So Kelborn from the discord asks, uh, any news on the life quake and its outcome? And to that, I say life quake. What does that mean? Guys, what's the life quake? So Alariel saw this vacuum from what happened with the whole Nagash being slapped down into Bone Town and, and, you know, was like, hey, there is a moment. This is my moment. Like right now, right you here, better. watching the world wake up from history, this is my moment. And I'm going <laughs> to, come on, I'm spaghetti. that was pretty good. And I didn't even sing it. <laughs> um, and so she spins this, like, mat. she goes back to the Etha Weird. She goes back to the Oak of Ages. And she spins this massive ritual that just like sends this surge of life, just as we had the surge of death, out into all of the realms. And spontaneously created through this are the War Song Revenants, which are these, I don't know, wood jesters. Uh, yeah. And they lead the charge as this realm of life wave goes throughout the realms. But turns out there are a couple things that were not necessarily intended. One of those being uh, the aforementioned Kragnos. He loves earthquakes, <laughs> but he hates cycles of life. And Does he hate them or he just doesn't care? No, and literally it was like, no, he despises them. Like, this is a, like he does not like them whatsoever. Um, perhaps because the carcass dance is literally being eaten by the other continents in Gur. He's developed this hatred for the natural order or something um but in gur specifically it has enraged the continent so they're now far more active but it also seems to imply that perhaps the incarnates are her fault as well because there's so much life magic flowing to these nexuses of power perhaps that's why the incarnates are are showing up now too i guess i thought that was maybe known already is this is this new information here I don't know, um, but to me, it seemed new. So it it is incarnates were referenced as a symptom of the right of life before we knew what incarnates were. Mm -hmm. It it talked about like the realms coming alive and like a creatures made of bone, walking fire, lightning that stayed, but they were never named incarnates. So this is sort of like confirming that's what happened. Got it. Right on. Also, note, show me some more incarnates. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Especially I want a, so many more. Gyran incarnate. I feel like that's going to be on the list. I want to see an Azurite one. Oh, that'd be super sweet. Yeah. Maybe we could have a gloaming incarnate. It described it as um, lightning would strike and then stay. So just spires of lightning moving across the land. Yeah. Right on. Excuse me, I don't know why I yelled like that. Um, all right, so uh, we've moved in. <laughs> sorry, to, I blew up. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm so angry. Uh, all right, right uh, the right of life um, has hit, and it has hit hard, ushering in this new age. Um, hallmarks being, you know, Kragnos and the Incarnates. Um, do uh, any stories from this time frame grab you guys that you want to talk about? So one, I like a little, little, not so much specifically for the story, but they're just something that made me chuckle. Uh, I actually didn't know the story of Echoes of Doom. So uh, for for folks who don't, um, it it is uh, Skaven come in, they steal some soul pods and then run away to their cool city. Uh, they are chased by Sylvaneth. And uh, Sylvaneth take a bunch of losses, but are victorious. Um, and they depart, but not before impaling Skritat on the spire of the city's highest bell tower to send a stark message. And uh, I read that and I was like, you know what message they, they think they're sending the message is like, don't mess with us. And the message that is actually being received is whoever was like the next in the pecking order is like, oh, sweet. I'm in charge now. Like yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever Skaven is next. I was like, perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. I'm much smarter and more clever and cunning and I will do better doing the exact same thing. <laughs> so to, to clarify, in case you didn't catch what Davey was saying, Echoes of Doom is the new box set that was released with the Skaven versus Sylvaneth. So that's the story he's talking about. The thing that um, struck me a little bit about that was that 
that they opened in the hole directly into the heart of Neos. So Neos are a thing that exists in, quote, real world, which are narrative event organizers. And so I was wondering if that was a little bit of a nod because the UK Neos are referenced in every battle town for 3.0 because they're playtesters for Path to Glory. And so I wondered if they were made officially a part of the place in the realms or something like that. So Absolutely not. Um, yeah. <laughs> Paul Wagner, avatar of Apophenia. <laughs> Boom. Uh, I thought, so we're talking about how um, the life quake had released Kragnos and we've talked at length about that in previous episodes. I'm sure you can find one that will enlighten you on that front. I will say that this, in some ways, the Sylvaneth, I don't know if they necessarily feel guilty about it, but they are reacting to this to some degree, both from a Krag, Kragnos rampaging across the realms, but then also the fact that the realms are alive and, and rampaging and like their natural order is being messed up, so to speak. And so a lot of the Sylvaneth are taking it upon themselves to try and do something about that. There's this um, gnarlwood um, glade that is all about this sort of magic and ancient lore and stuff like that and they and they realize that any work that they're putting in to try and like soothe the realms is just sort of dealing with like the symptoms of what's going on and they really need to get to the the source and there um are plenty of glades out there that are going to um try and figure out how kragnos can be defeated and slain um because it seems as if that might be the only way to bring some peace to you know at least Gur over there so add yet another um, faction to the list of the growing list of enemies to Kragnos because it seems like everybody's um, painting a target on that dude's back. And so Sylvaneth are yet another group that want to see him laid low. I actually did have one last thing, if that's all right, before we we, we transition away. And it's it's mostly what's not in the battle tome. Um, specifically at fan the... Fan fiction. Interesting oh, twist. Oh, it's not fan fiction. No, I'm it's kidding, I know. It's just what's in Broken Realms tech list that didn't make it over. Yeah. We, we've talked about how Lariel capitalized on, um, you know, Nagash going away. But in Broken Realms, Realms tech list, she sort of like halfway warns tech list slash gets permission. Hmm. Like, hey, you know that you left a power vacuum, right? And he's like, yeah, I know. I, I goofed up. <laughs> and you're fine with us. whatever happens next. He's like, "Yeah, I'll I'll deal with whatever's next." She's like, "Cool!" Like get, shoots him a thumbs up and then runs off to go do her own thing. <laughs> like, she knows like, what's up. Yeah, she knew exactly what she was doing. It was not a mistake. Good pull, Will. I, I was remembering that conversation from listening to you guys talk about it, but oh. I, I didn't remember exactly what the details were. So. Well, and it's go listen to that episode but like it's there's more to her like she has some great like scenes in oh, the broken yeah. realms but she, that that lady knows some stuff that she's not spilling um and that like there's yeah. a lot of cryptic like coded uh conversations between some of these elven gods that i, I it's plenty i think that still hasn't come to fruition yet um and i can't just wait to see where some of those go um well and it, it's it's funny because i remember we were like oh what could you be talking about what's the power vacuum who's gonna fill this space what's she afraid of no, she wasn't afraid. She was warning him. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's me. Yeah, up. <laughs> Surprises me. <laughs> it's a me, Alario. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Any other thoughts about the timeline before we move on to pressing it? topics? None from me. Excellente. Um, Paul, I got a question for you. Yeah. Uh, how would you say that this faction is organized? Whoa, that segue. Oh, it's That's so seamless. Segue. Uh, uh, seg you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh Alariel and her court are definitely like the top of the heap. And the Lady of the Vines, when she's not dead. <laughs> so you're saying like you're just a big heap too. <laughs> they wouldn't call themselves dead. Anyways, go ahead. But so Alariel has her court and there are are the, the tree lords are definitely part of that court. You're right, and that Ilariel and her court is are on top, and she's got um, essentially a bunch of these free spirits that like are attendant to her, and she can send on special min missions. But the majority of the Sylvaneth are broken out into these glades, right? So uh, they are, I don't know, um, I don't know, kingdoms you could possibly say, but they range in size and they're scattered out through all the realms. We were kind of talking about that before. A lot of them in Gairan, but they're they're every which way. Uh, I bet you, uh, I don't know for sure, but I reckon every realm out there has got. A, 
glades populating it, right? Um, yeah. So you'd say that they're uh, branching out? Mm. Ew, this guy. <laughs> Splinter is branching out. Okay. I mean, okay, well, it's, <laughs> I would say, and you know I would. Um, <laughs> and and so it's really these glades that um, are going to be the the both the the cultural like centers or you know the drivers um, of of uh, Sylvan society, and they also are, are providing a lot of the armed forces, right? Like they're also like the defenders out there too. So they're the ones who are getting the work done, if you ask me. And I'm sure you did. That's why you're listening to this uh, podcast. Yeah, I I felt like I, the organization was surprisingly uh, not not necessarily feudal. But like, yeah, nobility, kind of. like, yeah, I mean, I guess feudal, like they, there were noble lineages and they were, they were what they were because of their lineage, you know, like, because that's the family they're from. And, you know, it, this person, this uh, tree person put a seed pod down and became this thing. Like, I was like, oh, I, I don't know. I just kind of thought they might be a little more egalitarian or mm-hmm. something. I don't know. It felt, uh, so I was, I was a little surprised just how, uh, how like uh, born rich they kind of were with yeah. some of this stuff, and it it ties into the like fey inspiration that they use for the Sylvaneth. They even call them That's like you like at the beginning, sure. Because you've got like the royal moot, all of those super cool titles for those rulers are all of those titles are something that you would expect to see in like an old fairy tale, you know, the Archduke of Ironbark. Yeah, the the Dowager Queen of Heartwood, like it. It's all stuff that, like, I don't know if this is the first time I'm seeing this, but it sounds like it's been around forever. <laughs> yeah, it it was fun. Like that. This is the sort of thing if I was writing a battle tome, I would have a lot of fun with. Where it was like, let me think up some cool names for each of these. You know, right? Yeah. But they used old kings twice, and like that's that's rule number one is you can't use the thing twice. If you're going to do a whole bunch of list of things, you can't use the same title two times. Come on. What if they put um, ye old king and old king? Would that be yeah. okay or no? Yeah. That's uh, as long as one of them has an end or I'm not, an e in the old, uh, uh, then it's then it's all right. Then it's acceptable. Or an a u l d. Ooh. 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 Uh, no, but uh, so we're talking about so uh, there there are rulers to these glades. They have they have um, you know uh, appointed kings and like we just rattled off a whole bunch of different titles. So like each glade kind of has its own thing. They do it a different way. Sometimes it's you know your tree lords, yeah, or like a, uh, ancients and things. It, 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 different types of sylvaneth can be rulers of different glades depending on you know what their culture is and how how they operate. Um, you were saying you're you calling them feudal, although that's true. They didn't really spend too much time talking about what like the lower cast could be they're very well being right. they may not be a lower cast which is yeah hard to think of considering what we know about you know kings and feudal society and stuff like that they really only talked about like the nobility and didn't really point to if there was you know an under cast kind of like you know i didn't have their namardi right there there are no namardi equivalents um at the i didn't mm. which is maybe there are we just don't know about them or they don't talk about them you know what's missing from this battle tome i just realized it was in previous battle tomes was that the dryads were the farmers in the Age of Myth. I knew you were going to say farmers. <laughs> but, but <laughs> I didn't. It's, it's genuinely missing. It, it's no longer part of the, the lore for this battle tome. And you just made me realize it because it would fit in perfectly with a feudal system to have dryads be the farmers, they would be the peasants, and you have all these royalty mm-hmm. that would tell them what to do. And that part is completely absent from the way that this battle tome is written, and that part of the lore is not here. Um, so that is a departure from the past battle tomes. Okay. Farmgate 2022. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, nobody's hungry no more. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we already talked about the clans. We talked about the noble houses um, populated by these noble spirits. Yeah. Does anything, do you guys have anything else to add about the, the structure of Sylvaneth society? Seems rooted in their lamentary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we talked about what, the, what, the, what it's like at home. Um, I'd love to know, like, uh, what do you guys, I and mean, we guess we kind of already talked about it a little bit, but um, is there anything else to add about what their motivations are out in the realms? What are they trying to do? How are they trying to leave their mark on the place? Like what, what, what gets them out of bed every morning? Do y'all got any additional thoughts on that? I mean, it, it is, uh, it is spreading, you know, spreading the, the song of Alario, right? Like there's, uh, we'll talk about some of the units, but that's, that's really what's kind of making them interact more. I don't, I don't know if we glossed over this, but, you know, there there are, although Gairan is the, the home base, uh, they can, they 
can and have existed all throughout the realms, but it is more challenging in the other realms because, and, and when they get cut off from that song of Ilarial, uh, they can, they can kind of lose their minds or kind of lose their way and all that sort of thing. So I think, you know, spreading that gives them, I don't know, beachhead is kind of the wrong metaphor for it, but, uh, gives them inroads into other places, I guess. Yeah, true, true. Um, to build off of that question, what I'm asking, uh, a question from our Discord came from a patron of the show, uh, Dog Tired. And if you want to be a patron of the show, and I'm sure you do, uh, it's you can find more information there at uh, patreon.com slash the mortal realms. Um, but he asked, uh, if, this is a whole conversation that we were having on Discord, but if, if uh, Dog Tired had matched with a Sylvaneth on Bumble, what would its profile look like? What do they do in their spare time? Um, do they frolic? Do they nurture nature? Uh, is there hard gambling involved? Um, some sort of barn dancing? I, to that, I would answer yes to all of the above. I'm pretty sure, at least. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's a lot of singing, uh, if I understand correctly. A lot of making sure that humans don't get too uppity in the forest. Um, driving off chaos left and right. Seemingly not really concerned with the undead, surprisingly. Um just because it, it doesn't seem to be their main enemy. Um, it's your, your classic fae type uh, forest spirit. What, what I would love is having spent too much time on Bumble. You've got, you'll have the Sylvaneth and you see their profile. They've got the flowers. They're looking pretty. And then you swipe. And then suddenly it's the Lady of Vines with her camo leaf holding up a dead skaven. <laughs> <laughs> kind of fresh from the hunt. <laughs> I, you guys... I'm, I'm picking up through context that Bumble is a dating app. Is this yeah, no, I literally yeah. had to say the same thing. I'm like, now I got to figure out what Bumble is since you asked this question. I have no idea. Yeah, Bumble is a dating app and, you know, it's very bee themed. Uh, so if you're going to match with someone on it, you're going to match with Dridget Hermadreth because she's got all the, the hives built into her. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now I'm understanding. Now I get uh, it. Damn, all damn right. hives, though. Yeah. Endless spell, huh? It's, uh, is this, is this a, a single person's joke that I'm too married to get? Um, <laughs> yes. To, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, uh, yeah, I, I think that Sylvaneth would be like the manic pixie dream person uh, for you. Like, like they're <laughs> off doing crazy frenetic things that they're super into and like hope you're hope you're on board because they're gonna do it yeah all right right on. i mean they Good do question spend... dog tired i like that i like that off kilter question my salute when i ask those questions you tell me i'm just being completely off topic which is fair Yours are dumb <laughs> it's because you don't pay money to the podcast Paul. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> uh, I, no. I, I do think they spend a lot of time um managing or trying to grow their soul pod groves um, mm. trying to make sure that there are more um, of the Sylvaneth to help them with what they're doing. But also, I know I keep mentioning the Lamentary, but like that was something that was very obvious to me is that they spend a lot of time remembering what what the Sylvaneth were and trying to restore that former glory, um, which seems to be a lot of why they seem to be entrenched with their royal households and like this is the way it works and these are why these people do these things. Mm, yeah i mean it's it's almost a weakness of certain households yes exactly true, true 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 not almost is um all right speaking of how they live and how they interact with the realms let's talk about what allies they may or may not have uh these days did any allies jump out at you guys um either from the story perspective or from that allies list i feel like i don't look at that enough to like glean who their allies ought to be mm -hmm. but i'm gonna start doing it more and more um who do you think their allies are my friends my allies you guys are my allies, whether you like Aww. it or not. Um, <laughs> I mean, Stormcast are, are apparent there, uh, with notable exceptions, as we talked about uh, back with the uh, Stormcast that uh, kind of went rogue a little bit. Um, but uh, I, I think Hallowed Knights, despite a rough start to the relationship where they, <laughs> whoops-a-daisy, like led the enemy right into Athelweird, um, I think they kind of, prove their worth like they were instrumental in the war of life uh not well war of life slash uh realm gate wars uh in gyran they they had a huge role there um and so i, I think you you can't doubt that uh, the stormcast are are allied in this in this case yeah agreed will did any yeah. any allies strike you one thing that's interesting enough is someone i thought would be ally story-wise that aren't yeah, I know where you're going with this. Is the the Lumineth? Yeah, 
uh, you know, you think that they're they're elvish that there'd be that shared kinship, especially we had just talked about how Lariel had helped Teclis with taking care of the gash. But uh, for those who aren't too familiar with the Lumineth, they believe that like they need to stabilize the realms against chaos, which is sometimes searing huge runes like into the very fabric of the realms to stabilize things, which kind of isn't great when you're tearing down forests to put up a huge sign. If if you're a Sylvaneth, that's not something you're going to just stand by and watch. You're you're going to step up and um, like stop that from happening. I, f- I find it interesting. I'll, although, yeah, that's an absolute reason to not be friends. Like other allies are also doing things that they don't like sometimes too, right? Like you would yeah. think it like th- that would be just some some component of like oh, I, although we're friends, I just don't like that about you. Like they're, yeah. Stormcasts are also building like huge storm keeps out in the middle of the woods and stuff like that. Also not great. Um, so it seems as if that's relatively minor. I know it seems that's insane to say that it's a minor thing. Mm-hmm. Relatively minor in the grand scheme of alliances between factions, right? That they would get over it or like. They, I don't know, they be, they compartmentalize that to some degree. Um, and I wonder if this is a situation where it's just like the game dictating what should or shouldn't be allies as listed. I do see it as like, while it appears to be the same, you know, cut down forest, put new thing up. You know, the Sylvaneth are trying to in, preserve their ideal version of the realm. And the Lumineth are 100% stopping that from happening with the runes. You can always tear down a Stormkeep or Alariel's even used her magic to build um, cities that people could live in. But this is like a a different version of corruption of the realms. Sure. And actually, you're convincing me because to put it a, a, a different ways, it's not it's not just it's the problem isn't the runes it's the mentality behind the runes. It's yeah. it's it's they're doing this room because they are trying to control the way the world works yep. as opposed to just letting the world be what it is. When I build exactly. a storm keep, I'm not actively trying to affect I'm not trying to negate or, you know, exert my control on a place. Just I'm just building the storm. I'm building something here, yeah. whereas they literally think they know better than um, yeah. you know, the way the realms work, the Lumina that is. And that is anathematic to what the sylvaneth wants so okay yeah no i get that that makes sense i'm gonna give you props for that uh change that word anathematic 100 percent agree with it yep nice um but at the same time they're like friends with the fire slayers right and so like even that that doesn't yeah, jive yeah, right, right. <laughs> okay. um so it, it's not a clean clean division for sure no um pause i think you got a list a uh, listed item here on on the allies list what, what did you want to talk about when on the subject of allies with the sylvaneth i wanted to talk about the jade bloods um which are a specific call out they mention it twice um, but they're humans who n- live through the age of chaos in garan but never gave in specifically mentions that they worship kernwath and they now live with the sylvaneth outside Greywater fastness um so you were kind of uh, asking on the Discord, if you were like, hey, is this Dark Harvest? Because this sounds a lot like Dark Harvest. Dark Harvest-y. And this sounds a lot like Dark Harvest, but also it's just a cool thing that we've got these people who survived in the realms, but instead of um, attuning to what we expect now, they've attuned to Kernwath, which is a cool twist on what we've seen before so yeah i I enjoyed that quite a bit and a very cool book here's the deal i have never heard as a universally praised black library book as i have dark harvest without fail i feel like everybody i know who's read it has loved it and they are vocal about it um yeah so i recommend that highly We'll talk more about Black Library books later. Mm-hmm. All right, that's enough allies. You, you can't. Have, you can have too many friends. Um, let's not dwell much longer on that. Instead, let's talk about the enemies, which is always more interesting. You you are defined by your enemies. Um, what kind of enemies do the the Sylvaneth uh, have? Um, there's an obvious one, ripe for the taking. If anybody wants to talk about it, and I guess we already overripe have. for the taking almost. Ooh, <laughs> pustules. They'd be Nurgle. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they they are the cycle um opposites let's put it that way uh they long to completely destroy the realm of garan and to turn it into their own version of heaven which is hell so you know the uh the the realm of chaos for they now. don't think they're destroying it though 
I think they're yeah. making it better or like evolving it to its more pure form. Nurgle's blessings to all in the realms. So this is the thing, like I could see how the Sylvaneth could ally with pretty much anybody, but could you ever see the Sylvaneth actually allying with Nurgle? And what would be the reason for the ally? This is just a question I've, I've been pondering for the last couple of days. I guess against death would be the only thing that I could think of. I, whoa, it took the words right out of my mouth, man. <laughs> nice. Like that, that has to be it. Like, cause they're both cycles. They both are in very different ways, like promoting growth. Um, and death is looking for that stagnation. Like that is, that is what, uh, the gash is all about. Um, and, and, uh, if you even going back to the end times, like Nagash and Nurgle were kind of oppo- opposed a lot there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then here in Age of Sigmar, uh, Alarial and Nurgle have been very opposed. So like, um, yeah, I, I think that th- that is a circumstance where you might find that together. Um, in the same vein, though, you could also envision a world where death and Sylvaneth would be against Nurgle because both of them mm-hmm. would see Nurgle as a per- perversion of the thing that they want. And like, although they agree, I def- definitely don't want, I don't want death or I don't want life to be the driving factor. At the very least, I don't want this, this person perverting either one of them. And so like, sure. you could see how that like they could gang up. There's like a weird triangle. I don't love triangle. I hate triangle. I, uh, I saw, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Gosh, we are, we are like simpatico right now. I, love it. I was about to make the, like the, the hate triangle comparison. How would you swipe right or swipe left on Bumble for a hate triangle? <laughs> I don't even know how that works. That's when you swipe up. Okay. Yeah. Um, with that being said, then I, it's, I'll set it before and I'll say it again. I thought there would be more of a driving animus between the, the budding heads of life and death. And so there's, yes, the life quake is filling in that vacuum after death. But like that vacuum was more of like a magical vacuum. It, it wasn't inherently opposing death. It was inherently opposing like the wild, like uh, magical uh, effects on the realms is the way I read it. Um, it wasn't life chasing death. It was life just chasing up a hole essentially um and so like it why I, you would you would think that would be the hallmark of this book is how anti like how death is like front and center their biggest adversary it just it just didn't materialize for me um i'm surprised i am wondering if this might be a situation where they're letting the meta commentary kind of take over the narrative in the sense that all right we just spent how many years talking about death let's yeah. move on true which i get to an extent but also in the part of the book that's talking about the history of the soul wars i was expecting more soul wars mm-hmm. yeah agreed and especially because you we haven't we didn't get it in this we didn't get as much of that in the soul wars like the the life and death battle so like yeah. where else would you get it but here like there's no better place yeah. to highlight that um but oh well and one of the things that wasn't in the battle tome at all besides that one little story is Skaven. But if you actually read the booklet for Echoes of Doom, like they have so much back and forth as to why they would hate the Skaven and how the Skaven have hated the Ethelweird for so long. And there, there's a ton of lore in there about that. Um, and and they're tangentially mentioned only in the the tacit recognition that the the the, the battle box exists. Um, and so I thought that might have actually had more of a play in the battle tome as well, but it, it didn't show up as much as I thought. Say Levy. Ah, such is life. That's fun. That works. Um, all right. Uh, any other enemies that you, that you guys want to highlight? I don't know if I can handle multilingual jokes, but like you sound cool <laughs> now. So I appreciate it. Uh, it don't, don't be fooled my friend. Um, all right. Let's talk about, let's talk about some, how, how some lore intersects with the tabletop um now is the time of the show where we talk about some of our favorite units um whether from a lore perspective it probably you better have some lore component to it or just flat out the way you look or, or where they look or what they do um did you guys have any units that jumped out at you that you wanted to talk about here and now so this is this is a unit that's been around for a while in age of sigmar um but i i'd like what they did with the uh spirit of Durthu. Um, I, I like this idea. I, I, this is this is how I like having something kind of carried forward from the world that was like a reference to um, how can we make this like 
I, I wish there were more ways to do this. And I, I'm, I'm glad they found a way to do this is take a character from the world that was, uh, we don't need every single character to have made it somehow through the, the, you know, apocalypse. Um, but we have this cool model. So what are we going to do? And, and so I really like that, that they exist. And so they, they are, uh, great agents. There's, uh, there's an even more elite version of a spirit of Durthu, which is the sons of Durthu who are, um, close to Alariel. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I, I just, uh, it's it's less about what they actually do and more about how the writers found a way to like bring that forward. Um, mm -hmm. And I really appreciated that. I can't think of another example, even that it is both uh, a named character that has been brought. It, it's a named named character model that was brought forward. Um, that isn't the character anymore, but still references the character. I put a lot of qualifications on that, I realize. But there's been plenty, plenty of named characters that their models have come through and they've just been genericized, right? Like they just get a generic name and that's fine. Um, but this yeah. is a, 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 mo a character that's been genericized, but still references, like it's, it's an homage to the Jurassic from the old world. And I don't know that there's I, anything like that. Same, same boat. I can't think of anything. Uh, but listeners, if you can, yeah, please do, uh, please do write in and let Aaron know how wrong he is. It's one of my favorite. Things. I love it. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm a big fan. Just, yeah, yeah. We're always right. It's good. It's oh, good man. for me. It's a <laughs> so me. I did notice uh, I was reading through Echoes of the Echoes of Doom Battle Tome and or booklet. I, I realize I'm bringing this up a lot, but um, the spirits of Durthu and the Kernwath Hunters actually have more lore specifically in the Echoes of Doom booklet than they do in the Battle Tome, and it is not the same. The Lady of Vines and the Gossamer Archers entries are exactly the same, but those two actually have more in Echoes of Doom, um, which is a departure from what I've seen previously, where it's mostly like copy-paste. This is what's in the Battle Tome. This is what's in the, the Battle Box. Um, but that is different. Um, so there is a little bit more to read if you do get the Echoes of Doom battle box uh, lore in there. So that's cool. kind of cool. Did you uh, have a favorite unit that you wanted to talk about? Um, I really like the Revenant Seekers. Um, so the Revenant Seekers, because we're going to go back to that old saw that I have so far, um, cutting down those branches, uh, the Lemon Teary. Um, so the Revenant Seekers are these Dragon Spite Riders, but they go to seek out the lost lemon theory. They go to seek out those stories that have been forsaken. And so to go back to the Eider or the, the, the lost groves, like that's a super fun narrative hook where you have a unit whose intended purpose is to seek out lost lore through these lemon theory. And then you have these three named lost groves that you could potentially go and find information and like maybe rediscover some ancient history of the Sylvaneth themselves. So I, I appreciated those two ties together and I thought that was a, a fun way of incorporating a new unit. Right on. Um, I was going to do this last, but this segues into a thing I was going to bring up in that I like, um, it's always fun to see how GW gets creative with introducing new units that didn't exist before like where did they come from like why are they here now right and so paul you had mentioned before the dragon spites the things that um that they ride their mounts um were spites that were baked into the amber of the oak of ages and the fact that the oak of ages past had been corrupted had been knocked over and now recently with the right of life it's been sort of righted up and you know it's restored to its majesty and in doing so freed these sprites from the amber and now they've got these mounts and that's why they appear and so that's a fun little way to explain all right well this is why they didn't exist before and this is why uh they are here now uh let's um, reflect that against the uh, Gossin Mud Archers, which are also uh, new units. It's um, a bunch of like Revenant looking dudes that now have the same winged Zephyr sprites that the Arch Revenant had. And uh, if you were looking for an interested reason, interesting reason for why these dudes showed up, let me tell you, um, since the raising of the Oak of Ages past, Hilarial's people have been joined by a new breed of tree spirit, period, end of sentence, garbage explanation, and you need to give me more than that. Um, like, especially juxta <laughs> juxtaposed against the fact that you had a little blurb about the, the dragon spites. Give me something like don't just they don't just roll up they explain why they're here um so that was my <laughs> one of my pet peeves with this book i'm sorry i yelled again 
Uh, Will, did you have a favorite unit that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, uh, I was going to talk about the... Hopefully not the Gossamit Archers. No, no, no. <laughs> it does kind of tie into it, and it, it makes it even funnier. Um, so uh, you've got the Arch Revenant, who has the same Zephyr Sprite, Zephyr Spite, Spite. as the Gossamit Archers. So it's funny that like a new spirit arrived, which is just a Revenant with the same wings as someone else in a bow, but we needed the Oak of Ages to get them bows instead of just... They'd never heard of bows before. Yeah, Right. (laughs) They saw the Kurnoth Hunters and they're like, whoa, what are those? Tell me about this. Yeah. Okay. But I I love the Arch Revenant. One, it's just a really cool looking model. And then two, there's just something about the lore of them that like sings to me. Um, They... They're wanderers in the sense, like they're they're scouts, they're rangers. They get sent out to these like the f- little feudal kingdoms, but no one really likes them because they don't care about the politics of the feudal kingdoms. They're going to show up, they're going to lead an army, and they're going to kill things. And, and maybe it's the helmet, but it's giving me some sort of like weird the Mandalorian like Western cowboy vibes, like wandering samurai under orders of the queen. Yeah. They, they come like, it's like a samurai coming into a town. The local Lord doesn't want their help, but this is the only guy that can save them from the wandering hordes. And there's just something cool about characters in an army that are designed to be loners that aren't named. Mm -hmm. It's not a named model. It's not the, the wandering spear or whatever. There's just these guys and that's what they do. That is pretty cool. Um, I think the arch arch remnants are probably my favorite too. And I'm going to keep being negative. So get ready. Um, I'm kind of bummed (laughs) out that they kind of diluted it's it's look a little bit in, in, a, in a twofold way in that they took the cool helmet, like the distinctive looking helmet that it's got and put it on the uh, spite rider lancers, which to some degree, I don't really see the connection. I don't know why they are the same, right? So it diluted the look and then they took the Zephyr wings that was also very inherent to its like character and then gave them to somebody else too. And I'm like, well, no, it, you took the co- two cool things about it and just gave it away. It's, it's not unique anymore. Um, and I really liked its unique, um, yeah. unique look. If it makes you feel better, it, it could be diluted in a third way. Uh, or his super cool leaf cape, they just threw that on the Lady of Vines. Oh, also true. Okay, there you <laughs> also go. Also on the Warsung Revenant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, true. Okay, or war- yeah, yeah, yeah. Leaf capes are all the rage this year. They're all so the cool. <laughs> he is cool as heck, though. I love that model. He's great. Um, I don't even know that I have a favorite per se. I'll, I'll just talk about something, which is to say the, the tree revenants. Um, so they've been around for a bit, uh, and um, they talk about how they are a, a, a mix or they're an amalgam uh, creature and that it's it's half barky like wood wood structure um that but are inherited by the are inhabited by these spirit forms um that are in some ways intentionally uh resembling these they call them the protectors which uh were from the world that was which i don't recall wood elves really ever being called protectors but it can't be anything else but that right they have to be emulating the look of wood elves right that's what we took that to mean well yeah aaron great idea (laughs) yeah protector i don't know I don't specifically remember the protectors, but they did have men here stones and they did have spites in the old world as well. So I, I'm not sure if they're just intended to be larger spites, right? Because they're called spite revenants. So perhaps that's what they're kind of referring to, but I'm not 100% sure. You no, know, so I think the, the book here was saying that like the, the elf form part was intentionally supposed to look like. Uh, these protectors of old of the of the um, world that was at least that's how I what I would read. I'm going to prod prod the cub here and say I don't know if they're intended to be elven. Well, now I gotta look, um, but it, <laughs> I'll ask a question while I look. And um, this relates to a question that uh, Fredericks. Oh, that's a fun way to spell that. Um, he, they ask, uh, how does Sylvaneth relate to elves, really? And what determines the gradient between elfiness and branch barkiness? And so a lot of that is going to be hinging on the, the tree revenants. But how do you guys fi- uh, feel the Sylvaneth relate to elves and whether it's design or I'm trying to think of another <laughs> metric that you can compare them to? Um, lore culture, Wild what have you. have some super cool helms. Sorry. The arch revenant yes. and the revenant seekers. Have cool yes. helms and the wild rider models. I thought had cool helms. 
Uh, Arch Revenant, Revenants and Spite Rider Lancers are the ones with the, the cool okay. corn helms. Yeah. It sounded like I said corn. I meant to say horn helms. Uh, you definitely said corn. <laughs> yeah. uh, back to the true Revenants, though. Uh, their appearance is undeniably eerie. A mixing of gnarled bark flesh and glowing forms said to resemble the protectors, mysterious figures who once guarded the forests of the world that was. Who but wood elves is it would that apply to? Especially looking at them and they look like elves. Like, what, what else could that be? Nope, can't think yeah. of anything. And you're so right. And handsome. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and like I, the, gosh, I, every time I try to talk about Aaron, my voice goes up like four <laughs> octaves. I don't get it. <laughs> no, that's the uh, the fifth person on the show. Can't we talk <laughs> Aaron? Yeah. Um, Be quiet. Back to your hole. <laughs> but keep saying those nice things, though. Um, yeah, yeah. Don't stop that. Uh, so I. I'm right. Okay, I'll, I'll just be the authority here, and I'll say that that was presumably our elves, and maybe even wood elves. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that it says that it is like they're built to resemble elves from the world that was, and then you know, Alariel had elves. The world exploded. She left the exploded world. Had all of these soul pods. Like, I don't. <sighs> It's like it, it's not enough evidence to hold up in court, but what else are you supposed to assume? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> that I they think, were at least once elves. I think so too. Yeah. However, I will say that I'm still not 100% sure what that revenant part is, right? So I, I get barky body parts. I, we've been seeing that for a while. I'm familiar with dryads, but like I, I don't know that the book spends too much time even talking about like what the revenant part of a Sylvaneth is. Is and I guess I wish I would have known more about that. Like over half this army is made up of that spirit stuff coming out of wood. Um, what if I poke it? Does it does it give? Like can I can I put my hand through it? Like what I don't know. What are they made of on that side? Um, and I don't think the book spends too much time talking about it. Maybe it's in older books and they don't they don't want to retread old ground. I'm not sure, but um, I'd like to know. I I did hear someone say that they wanted to try painting that part up in skin tones, and I'm immediately disgusted. Grossed it. out. Yeah, no thank you. <laughs> Objection. All right, uh, any other units that you guys want to talk about? Because there's one more we got to bring up because folks ask questions about it. Or two two more we have to talk about because people ask questions about them. Well, then let's do the questions. All right, let's do the questions. All right, so Chrisling. Uh, asked, uh, do the Warsong Revenants have any particular connection to the world that was due to them being born from the Oak of Ages Past? That's a good follow-up question because we're literally just talking about connection to the world that was. Uh, do the Warsong Revenants have any connection that you guys saw? I mean, uh, it's literally there with the Oak of the Ages Past, but I, I wasn't able to draw any other parallels. I don't know. Aaron, you were more plugged into Wood Elves, so was there anything you saw? Um, n- n- no indirect connections that came to mind. And also, I mean, also no direct connections, but I feel like yeah. that was that was maybe obvious um, beyond just that they, what, they sprung from like the acorns or something from the Oak of Ages Past. Um, so, yeah, not necessarily. And I would have loved to have seen it. I wish I could come up with one, a satisfying connection, but it's just... It's just not coming to me, um, which is fine. I mean, just like the elfy look could be sufficient, I suppose. Um, and they both armies have, you know, that f- fey element to it, like mysterious, uh, like haunting songs and things. And that's a lot of what the vibe I'm getting from the uh, the Piper aspect of the Warsong Revenants. So uh, I wish there was more connection, quite frankly, because big, big Wood Elf fan. Um, did, did you guys see any the other hosts? Did you guys see any other connections to the world that was through the Warsong Revenants? No, oddly enough, like we talked about with the tree revenants, I've seen more connections on to, from other units than the ones directly associated with the Oak of Ages. Yeah, yeah. true. And even from other armies, uh, sometimes, right? Like, well, yeah. maybe not to like what else, but um, just of the world it was, period. Like, it seems more inspired from some of the other elven armies. Uh, neither here nor there. Uh, so the connection is yet to be found, I would say, uh, Chris Ling. Another question. Uh, Thundercake asks, uh, does the resin model that was removed from the army still get any page time in the lore, or was it removed completely? And I believe he's talking about the Branch Wraith, which I last I checked has been in every Sylvaneth battle tome up until this point, um, a hero character, kind of a caster that, uh, again, talking about the world it was, was, was a model that got ported over from the old Warhammer fantasy, uh, a noteworthy omission from this here battle tome. Um, 
I know the answer, but do you, what do you what do you guys think? Any any uh, reference to this branch wraith that we're missing? I did not see one. I didn't see anything. It was there were branch witches. I did not see a branch wraith mentioned here. Yeah, but I mean, the, before it was a branch wraith, it was Draka, mm-hmm. and we do have a new Draka. So, but yeah, we don't. I, I don't see any reference to the old resin model. So no reference to the model. However, the word branch wraith does appear in the book. In the Dryad entry, it references their leaders. And in the same sentence where it lists the branch nymph, which I believe is like the leader character of the unit of Dryads. That's like the, the what's the word for leader? I can't remember. Um, Champion. I don't play the game. Uh, but it also <laughs> says uh, the branch wraiths are there. So uh, their branch wraiths and elder branch nymphs are renowned for their ability to resonate with it, these energies. And they're talking about energies um, of the, the Sylvaneth. So the word's in there. And so the question is, should it have been removed? Or was this part of some text that just had been ported over, copied over, hadn't been looked at in a while, and didn't they didn't note that they needed to remove it? Or was the branch rate though, an omission that should have been in the book? I don't know. Because uh, it's rare these days for a model that has been in Battle Tomes to be removed from Battle Tomes. Um, if there are many examples of them, I can't think of it. We were talking about this in the Discord, too. Um, so, yeah, what happened to the branch wraith, you guys? Hmm, mysteries. Cool and great. Um all right, uh, we talked about units. Let's talk about some of these uh, sub-factions. But in the case of the Sylvaneth, they're called Glades. Did anybody have any uh, favorite Glades? And there are a lot of them, so I bet you there's, some, there's something for everybody, I think, in here uh, that y'all wanted to talk about. Yeah, uh, so I like the Iron Bark. Yeah, um, you do. And this is a Glade that went to Shaman uh, and discovered that as they put their roots down, they were able to leach up some of these uh, metals and minerals that are in the soil. And even here, it takes... Uh, takes care to note that they they did so um like they didn't take more than they needed mm. uh but it has the effect of like having um streaks of metal and crystal growths within their within their bark and it makes them you know super hard and durable and that'd been fine if that was all it was but i i like it for that in that like you talk about aaron like hey what does this faction look like if it's in a different realm mm. you know um so it's fun right for that um, but that they have an affinity for, uh, Duarden, like was, a was a kind of a, a, another fun twist. So like they're, they're good at, um, forging things and, uh, because they are, I, they're like temperamentally in tune with Duarden, uh, in a way that's pretty fun. Uh, and it, those are two factions that traditionally, like if you go back even into the world that was, uh, where there was animosity between Wood Elves and Dwarden, um, or Dwarves at the time. Uh, I, I love any time they can find a way in Age of Sigmar to like, take your expectations and subvert them a little bit. And that's what this faction does for me. So uh, that's my choice. Very cool. What else you guys got? I like the Harvest Boon. Or like the the millennial version of the seven. <laughs> just like, put it. we got everything figured out and we're totally cool and we're gonna make everything work and then they make a couple mistakes but nothing too bad and and all the old uh glades are like oh it's so cute watching them make mistakes like we used to do 17 centuries ago <laughs> right um but it's fun because they ally with dawnbringer crusades quite often um so, and, but then they also will fight them if they're like, hey, but like, this is the best place for us to be. So like, you know, I know I helped you like five minutes ago, but like, seriously, like I, I want that space. Um, and they're also the ones that are most uh, connected to the Warsong Revenants. And they tend to like be swept up in their, their melody. So I, th- I thought that were Those are cool. Well, uh, what's, what's your fave out there? I'm going to go with the Dreadwood. Um, they live in the deep, dark places, a lot of Shaish and Olgu. And it's just like, if you hear the stories of things moving in the woods and people disappearing in the shadows, it's these guys. They're, they're <laughs> scooping people up. They're stabbing them to death. Uh, your classic evil, angry forest spirit things. And another thing I love is they have their leader, um, the, the Keeper of Dreadwood, but most people kind of just care about uh, the queen of the outcasts, Drecha. But they just swear fealty to her because she kills people. And they're like, nice. 
Um, and the people they almost hate the most are the other Sylvaneth, uh, the Oakenbrow. It's like, oh, those guys, they get to go live in the sun, whatever. They don't know what it's really like down here. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, I mean, Definitely an interesting perspective on Sylvaneth for sure. And introduces a lot of the in, in truff faction fighting. You know, I, we're seeing a little bit more of that, I think, in the more battle tomes we read. Because that reminds me of the uh, Darters of Cain that we were just talking about. Um, you know, seeing more of that stuff in these factions. Um, I'll talk about the Heartwood uh, Glade. Um, we kind of already referenced them before in that they were that glade that was very uh, closely aligned with Kurnoth and uh, Kurnothiel. Um, and they were the one that were always almost wiped out, uh, that lone Sylvaneth who had saved Kurnoth's uh, spear. Um, but they have, uh, I don't know, been brought back from the brink. They're incredibly loyal. Uh, they, uh, ha- are happy to work with other Sylvaneth glades, but then also other moral races. And they're happy to be on the front lines, um, to, you know, uh, fighting bad guys and, uh, defending places that ought to be defended um but it's they're very like supportive and loyal and like i I really dig that aspect of them um but to say nothing of their their loyalty to kurnoth as well that also is one of their hallmark um components as well to that end we got a couple more questions about kurnoth and this i'm always kicking myself by adding questions like this towards the end of the show because we, we dabble on this stuff earlier and i just i need better placement i need to do a better job you guys uh for you the listeners um but question from thunder cake who had asked the question before but uh he asked this uh what is the current interplay between alario and kurnoth kurnos kurnoth slash kurnos uh is there one is the old god of the hunt mentioned at all he is quite a bit and i feel like we, we touched on the few things that uh we've seen in this book does anybody else have any other mentions of kurnoth or uh well i, f- I feel like it, there's another connection and that's part of a, a future question that's coming up so let me ask this next one here uh patron of the show will wallace has a question for us thank you for, thank you will um any future hints or suggestions of mortal elvin kurnathi uh he's still keeping a candle lit for all aerial light forest stalkers in Gurkrai. so up until this point i feel mm. like we haven't talked about the kurnathi very much and i've been holding off now is a great time to do so um kurnathi elven worshippers of kurnath uh bestial aspects what uh what what strikes you about the Kurnathi, and um, do we? Where do you think we're going with this? Again, maybe we hinted at it earlier, but let's spend more time with it. Well, can I say this also kind of refers to Sage Mutt Fourteen's question: Have the Kurnathi elf, centaur, and fawns been touched on again? Any chance they actually have species names? Good job. Good. Uh, keep me honest. Thank you, Dave. Please <laughs> sure. do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the the piece I took away, and it was very limited, it was just in passing, uh, but it talked about the elven uh, worshippers of Kurnathi and saying that some, some were uh, e- even took on like these uh, bestial aspects. Um, and so what that told me, and this is, this is kind of borne out a little bit by um, Aaron, you and I just covered a Kurnathi story uh, for pocket realms. Um, that it sounds like not all Kurnathi have, the uh, aspects of beast that you would see in that uh, beast grave war band, the uh, skates wild hunt. Yeah. Um, uh, but enough are, and and that's, that's about all we got. But what I like is it kind of opens the door like, Hey, like we are thinking about this. Like we, we didn't, there wasn't just an idea that we came up with and then dropped. So that's, I, unless I missed something more and maybe you guys caught some. No, I think you're right. I think you touched on it. Exactly. Well, hundred percent. There is also, the, in, in the next statement, it talks about how some Karnathwi have also been seen wearing, bearing lamentiri, which again mm. is the history of the Sylvaneth. Though the Sylvaneth do not speak of such things. So if they're not carrying the history of the Sylvaneth, what are they carrying the history of? Because that's what those lamentiri are from. Yeah, I wonder I wonder if they are, though, yeah. you know, because they're they're pretty tightly wound right like entwined well but it it seems to say like so this is like basically another version of the outcast right where we just don't like like we don't talk about bruno we don't talk about the outcast right we don't talk about bruno we don't talk about the kanafi you keep talking about them though you're explicitly not supposed to i I mean like yeah i mean like it's not in the rules of the game (laughs) but Fair, rules of fair. this podcast rules of polite society <laughs> um so i, I thought that was fun 
I mean, it was a fun little twist. I'm like, how are we going to maybe see that come to fruition? You know? uh, my my scry is that this will be a Kurnathi will be a subfaction of Sylvaneth in the same way that like Cruel Boys are the subfactions of or like a like a whatever the word is a wedge Ooh. of the Orc mm, War Clans yeah. is, is my You're gonna see them is my blossoming into their own subfaction, huh? Yeah, absolutely correct. That's that's why I hope I both. I, predict and hope they will go uh and yeah. say sage much to your additional question you asked did, do they have species names nope next question um <laughs> they don't exist nice we're moving through it so we've chatted about some uh notable special characters um i feel like we've talked about lady of vines enough we don't need to cover that one um have, is there any more to say about Alariel? i feel like we even talked about her quite a bit her history she rides a giant beetle which is pretty cool and it's like it when it dies, she can like just get she can grow a new one. Like so it's not the same beetle every time. Um, I think that was interesting. Uh any more to say about Alariel herself? Uh yeah. So I, I think for folks who are not aware of uh some of the history, I think we know that she was a being in the world that was, but during the end times, um there was Ariel, who was the the queen in the woods with uh, the wood elves. Uh, sort of the overall region. And then there was Alariel, who was the Ever Queen over with the High Elves. And they were both their kind of respective avatars of Isha. Uh, and the goddess, the elven goddess of the moon. Um, Paul, can you help me out with Lilith? Lilith? Lilith. 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 Yep. Yeah. Uh, actually poisoned Ariel. Uh, and it was, it was, there was sort of a convoluted plan where she was going to uh, protect her mortal lover and her daughter by, by doing this. Um, and uh, Alariel uh, goes to the, the old world there and uh, goes into uh, potentially heal Ariel or, or not, but then they end up combining. So they, they become one being. Uh, Alarial, and that is the being that becomes the incarnate of life, and then goes forward and becomes a goddess in this. Um, uh, so that uh, it, it is a little confusing to kind of if you're trying to keep track of of some of that, but that's that's the the rough summary. So this uh, this Alarial that we know is kind of uh, two people uh, from from the world that was, which is you know worth worth. Uh, being aware of, I guess. Yeah, agreed. That's a good point. Good, good, good background information to have. Cool. We covered her, top to bottom. So we had we've alluded to Trisha. So yeah, she's the leader of the Outcast. She's this very capricious uh, creature. It was in um, Alariel's darkest hour. It's that time of shrouds or whatever of shrouds uh, it was, where she had to like generate these outcasts. And she's like, all right, well, I got to pull in. I got to. I never thought I'd do this, but I'm going to pull in this this character from my past that needs to be brought in because she too was a, a like we had mentioned a, a creature from the world that was, um, and then she plants the soul pod of Dritcha Dritcha. Uh, <laughs> she comes comes roaring out says, "Finally, someone let me out of my cage," uh, and she's here to wreak yeah. havoc uh, on uh, the mortal moral realms but in service to um Alario. although they don't necessarily always see eye to eye there is a there is a camaraderie there and maybe not camaraderie but like there's a respect level and uh Alario doesn't always agree with Trish's methods but she lets her off her leash and um gosh darn she gets results so um and she's got a bunch of bees or like beehives it's not really bees it's like sp- spites but um and we're back to bumble and we're back to bumble always <laughs> comes back to bumble um, any other Hammerdreth thoughts that you guys got? Still an amazing model. That's about it. It's pretty neat. I will say the the spites seem flat. Like if you put this, because you can do, do two different things, but the, when they're coming out of her arm, like the model wise, it's like, it's very like 2D and it kind of throws me off. Um, but the small complaint, otherwise mm-hmm. cool as heck. I think I'll skip the underworld stuff because we kind of already, we mentioned Ithari. Mm-hmm earlier in the timeline and then we just kind of talked about skates wild hunt so we'll just leave that alone we don't need to get into that i will say at least that it is cool that they both showed up yeah true uh, they're, they're both showed as like representative of the faction as a whole um because in a lot of the other battle tomes they don't show like underworld folks don't show up at all mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's well, true and and that is an omission that was I, I felt missing from this battle tome is that we didn't get any of the summary from loon curse which is the previous battle box we got for the last so in this battle tome, 
there's no mention of it in the timelines or in the actual narrative itself. So I wish we'd have had more of that. I forgot all about it. Um, all right, we're getting close. Home stretch, guys. Let's. Are there any other points or thoughts that we we're not able to cover earlier that you guys want to bring up now? This is a free for all. Nothing's off the table. That's not. There's lots that's off the table, um, <laughs> but. I'll be the judge of that. So if we're in free for all, there was one thing that uh, I noticed um, that I, uh, it was somewhere in the, I think it was the section called Deepwood Hosts. And it was talking about, you know, it's like, we, we already know this idea of like Sylvaneth are um, following seasons, like their cycles and seasons. And, you know, there can be the aspect of, uh, you know, they're flowering in the summer and, bitter in the winter and all that sort of thing. Uh, but this talked about, it listed a whole bunch of different seasons that existed in different realms. Um, and I was like, Oh yeah, obviously like our de- idea of like four seasons is like extremely limited. If you're in these magical realms, there's so many other seasons that could exist. And the Sylvaneth, if those were the, you know, like let's say there was a seven seasons in a you know particular realm or whatever, or part of a realm, then the Sylvaneth in that part of the realm would mirror those seven seasons. And I was like, ah, man, that, that is, that's really cool to think about. Like that's, that's the stuff that, uh, makes me happy that we're in Age of Sigmar, you know, um, where, where there's so many more possibilities than there were when we were in the old world. Yeah. Types of possibilities you wouldn't even think of. What else you got? Free for all. Keep them coming. This is a open, open forum. Cause I'm going to do mine. You're not going to like them. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is all, just quick thoughts off the cuff. Um, one, why are skates wild hunt oak and brow? That's dumb. Like there's literally a whole glade that's all about being about Kurnoth, the, literally the one I <laughs> talked about, and yet they still got the oak and brow keyword. Mm, mistake. Incorrect. Mm. Uh, try again. Whoops, daisy. Yep. <laughs> um, I think is what it is, is whenever they do uh, the Underworld's war bands, they always give them the default like uh, faction. Yeah. Like it, they give them the hammers of Sigmar equivalent for every faction. So this was just a yeah. copy and paste job. But still, come on. You, you knew I, GW, you knew I was going to read it. Why, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> Next, uh, I do like the fact that they, in the Branch Witch uh, entry, they talk about, they, they just, they call out the fact that there's a wide range of different spites that they have, and it's not just the bitter grubs. And so you, for those of you familiar with the model, there's the branch, which has got the scythe and they got that grub grown out of its back. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. I don't love how sometimes with the background of these different models, they always describe them as like every example of this thing always have that has that unique feature. Like every branch, witch has a bitter grub or every like, I don't know, whatever caster has like the shoal of particular fish which is insane like you'd think there'd just be such variety in the realms that a branch witch could have anything and so and and if oftentimes they don't have grubs in fact most of them don't have grubs you would think and it's cool that they call out the fact that like they have all sorts of different spites they have an affinity towards spites it's just that a bitter grub happens to be one of them um which i thought i like i like to see um i like my i like variety out there um next we're keeping going um we didn't really get into clearly talking about the difference between the noble spirits and the free spirits we i think paul wanted to get into it at one point but uh in the organizational the org chart of uh sylvaneth there's a whole bunch of units that are considered free spirits which is to say they're not part of uh the classic glade system or like a clan system at all um but rather they just sort of serve at the behest of Illyrial. they serve at the uh, honor of the president or whatever the line from uh, west wing was <laughs> uh and so uh, those are the free spirits, but the noble spirits are those that are in your traditional system. Uh, noble, hence we we're talking about like houses of nobles um, in the in the glades. However, as they've added more and more units to this, the whole dis- the whole clear like the distinction between the two is ludicrous and insane. And I don't know how they decided who fell into what bucket. Um, in that things that obviously should have been grouped together are completely not, and I don't understand why. Um, for example, uh, and, and to say nothing of yet the forest folk, which is the third distinction, which is where the dryads fall and also the lady of vines, but the branch witch doesn't, even though look at that branch witch. It's obviously a dryad. Like, what are you talking about? Um, <laughs> look at your things. Uh, and the fact that the the tree lords are separate, and I guess that maybe makes a little bit more sense, but the fact that gossamid archers are considered uh free spirits no they are not yeah. they are obviously tree revenants who have a bow and so yeah. the wings on their back put them where they belong and i don't know just absurd to me it was already tenuous in previous battle tones but these new things that got introduced it just blown the thing wide open and, and 
it's just absurd. Um, yeah. Don't you people realize you are ruining Aaron's spreadsheets when you make up these rules? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, it's just do better. Well, okay. What's even even worse for you, Aaron, is, is like because they say the free spirits only answer to Alariel, and like that's it. But then they still get the Glade keywords. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the reason I don't like the what is the um, what are they called the Spite Rider Lancers is because they look like the Arch Revenants, which is a cool thing and a cool concept and a cool lore thing. But then you dilute it and you put them on the back of this Spite and like, well, are they related? Do they have any similarities whatsoever? It doesn't talk about it. Like those dudes look the yeah. same. Why do they look the same? Yeah. What does the helmet mean? Yeah. Tell um, me more. Yeah. But no, no connection whatsoever. And so I feel like it, there are holes in some of these like descriptions and, and they, they weren't filled in this book. Um, all right, I'll get off my soapbox and my high horse and I'll leave my ivory tower. Um, and I'll ask, do you guys have any other things you guys want to bring up? So there were two mentions of things that were mentioned and nothing was done with them, which I was intrigued by. Uh, number one, there's something called the Royal Huntmaster of Kurnoff, which seems to be a normal office. Um, that is taken by somebody in a glade. And then also the whole dress, which again is a normal office that is taken by someone in the glade, but it wasn't elaborated on. I don't know what those are. They sound cool. You and me both. All right. Uh, for the most part, all the other listener questions made it up into the body of the show, which is rare, but we all did it. Congratulations, everybody. Um, so now is the time where we can start talking about some... If you got, Hey, folks, if you want to if you want to read more about the Sylvaneth specifically in the Black Library uh, arena. The obvious one, which is uh, The Legends of the Age of Sigmar, colon, Sylvaneth, which has been out for a while now at this point, but like, what better place? It literally, it's in the title, and it's a bunch of short stories about the Sylvaneth. Again, hearkening back to more the, the Realmgate Wars era, and so it's not necessarily as caught up with some of the present day, but at the very least, you're going to get Sylvaneth action, wall-to-wall, top-to-bottom Sylvaneth action in The Legends of Age of Sigmar or, or Sylvaneth. Yeah, I, I think uh, it kind of came up before, but Dark Harvest was kind of a, a good niche to uh, look at here, speci- specifically with how Kurnoth does or does not factor into everything. Um, so, absolutely. Okay, well, I well another great one, and I haven't read it in a while, but I do remember really liking it. Was the Garden of Mortal Delights by Robert Rath? Um, that's a, 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 a trippy one to some degree, but it, it yeah, but it's super good. Um, Robert Rath hadn't, hasn't written too much for Black Library, but this one really stands out for me. And then I think we had mentioned before the the Tainted Axe earlier. It's a, a Eight Lamentations short story by Josh Reynolds. Um, and that talks about like that knightly order uh, follower of Illyrio, the human. Um, but that's pretty cool and a quick read and and, and uh, if you like the Eight Lamentations, you gotta you gotta read the Tainted Axe. Oh, and if you like um, Order of the Fly, you gotta read Tainted Axe because they mm. are the antagonists. How could you not? Yeah, I don't want don't want to be friends with somebody who doesn't like uh, the Order of the Fly. Um, all right, that's probably all the recommendations we'll do. We're almost there, guys. Hang with me. Can you please let me know what you thought about this battle tome? Um, uh, battle tome colon Sylvaneth. Uh, Paul, what did you think of this here book? Tell us about it. I'm going to go with uh, six of eight spider legs. It, it was fun. I, I learned new stuff, which I appreciated. Um, I, I was hoping, I think, for a little bit more progression or a little bit more elucidation into what was going on with Kragnos, etc. And we didn't get that as much. Um, but it was definitely different from the previous battle films. So I appreciated that quite a bit. And the things that I was missing from the battle tome were present in the Echoes of Doom lore booklet. So I, I didn't feel like I ended up losing uh, the extra lore. So all right, cool. Uh, all right, um, who was next, Davy? What you think? Uh, what you think of Sylvaneth? Uh, I will go with uh, hmm, one out of two goddesses combined, or one out of two. Uh, elven ladies combined into one that's a 50 percent. yeah i it just was like it it didn't uh as as someone who's kind of read a lot about sylvaneth uh dating all the way back i I didn't feel like i got a whole bunch of new stuff here um um so didn't hate it didn't love it um and uh i think i think if you 
are a big Sylvaneth fan, you're going to enjoy it a lot more than me. Uh, for me, I'm kind of digging for, for new things more than reveling in something. Um, so that's, uh, that's where I kind of let, and, and part of it was like, uh, I had a revelation, like some of the way through where I was like, yeah, I mean, I know like it's right there in the name, like Sylvan forest. Right. But, uh, they are, uh, they, they are the realm, the, like the, the champions of the realm of life, right? Like they, the, um, their goddess is the, was the incarnate of, uh, of life magic in the, in the world that was, uh, and it occurred to me like, like forest is just one very small part of nature, right? Like there's, there's prairies and meadows and like, let's go underwater and like sargasso, like, you know, whatever, like seaweed forest or something like that. And I was like, just give me a little bit of that hint. Like th that's the stuff that we love about the mortal realms. Mm -hmm. Like, give me, give me a little taste of that. Like what, what is the, uh, you know, what if there was, um sylvaneth that interact with the Ideneth because they are like exist in and around coral uh, like a, a giant coral reef that is has underwater sylvaneth like i i feel like there's so much more room and i know you're kind of constrained and restricted by the models you have but um but you can do those throwaway uh pieces in in that uh in those stories or anywhere in there um and i want a little bit more of that i want them to branch out a little bit more from where they're at <laughs> not intentional don't hold me to that um that was, that was not just it just happens sometimes um anyway so that that's that's where i'm at and and honestly it's probably more than 50 50 but that's the silly rating i came up with so silly that's what that when i think about davy i think it, i think silly um and you should and i do uh hey will what'd you think about uh, this year battle tom um I think I'm going to give it a five out of seven New seasons in the mortal realms. Okay. Different. Mm -hmm. All right. That's not what I was going right. to do. Okay. Well, <laughs> I keep on stealing yours, so I had to change right. it up a bit. It's cool. Um, and the, the reasoning is like a lot of what Paul and Davey had said. And then also like, I, I did enjoy a lot of those smaller stories. Um, the ones that, you know, the ones that didn't tie into anything we've seen before, just a little like, oh, hey, they hit, they hung out with Gargans and they hung out with Ogors. And I always think that stuff is super cool. But I also feel like I should I should be used to this by now of like everything we've seen in the Broken Realms was leading up to the right of life and the right of life happened. And everyone's like, what's going to happen next? They name drop Aethel Lauren. And I never saw that show up once like even in reference that she had done it like let alone move anything forward and it, it feels almost like they took a step backwards from where we had left them off at um like like not even that we didn't go forward but they're now not acknowledging the name of Aethel Lauren like back to where we were and it just I, I like when the story has a story and moves forward and mm -hmm. progresses. I get that for sure. So my rating was going to be a five of seven of the glades that were in the book, right? There's seven oh. of them, I think. Four and yeah, four and three and seven. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm hearing I'm hearing a lot of what you guys saying, and I, that's the problem with going last because I agree with um, a lot of it. It's um, someone that's been around for a while, and so like because of that, they got to retread a lot of ground. Um, we saw that with the daughters of Cain, and so we're seeing that with the Sylvaneth too. Um, with daughter, with the daughters of Cain, a lot of the big action, the recent action, had just recently happened, and so like they spent a lot of time in that battle tome talking about the recent events. And this, on the Sylvaneth side, it, it they were recent events, but they seemed to be forward facing, kind of what Will was saying before. Like they they seemed like they were going to have ramifications, and I, the ramifications exist. We saw a lot of that stuff in Broken Realms already, but it's I wanted to get more of the Sylvaneth version of what had done what had recently been done and what it meant for them and I, they they touch on it they allude to it they give you some glimpses of all right well the life the, the realms are alive now right but i, I want to know more about what that means and what does it mean to them and how do they feel about it and 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 if you can't tell me what the next action is going to be what the next step is going to be then focus more in the um here and now and have the impact be big like i want the impact to be big for the sylvaneth and not the impact to be big for someone else which is what it really boiled down to it it's the life quake or you know the right of life was for someone else it was for it was a it was to drive Kragnos's story and it doesn't really necessarily drive the sylvaneth story i don't care about i've said it before don't care about Kragnos. i want to know how it affects the people i do care <laughs> about um and so it 
it become it becomes clear that it's just it was just a they couldn't think of a driving of factor to make Gur come alive. So this this is the the stand in. This was what obviously their focus is more of a, a Gur focus and not a Gyran focus, which bumps me out. I like Gyran better. Um, uh, I, I'm, it seems a little, the book seemed a little disorganized. I'm not just a fan of the direction that they took with some of the, like the structure of it. I talked about like the noble spirits and the free spirits. It seemed a little random and it, I don't, I feel like I don't know what they want to do with this army. It's, it's relatively one dimensional with, uh, the protecting natural places, protecting fonts of like, you know, life magic. It needs to be more than that. And, um, because given the infinity of the realms, there ought to be depth to this army. And kind of to what Davy was saying too, like where's the variety? But even if not variety, I want I want some more depth, and I want to know what what is actually going on with these people, um, or if these people loosely, like we talked, I talked about, like what does it mean to be a tree revenant? What's that spirit part? Like what is that? Like what what are they? Um, and you don't, I don't know. I feel like this book didn't answer a lot of those questions, and even some of the Black Library stuff that we read doesn't answer a lot of those questions and i suppose you can make the argument that sylvanet they're supposed to be a mystery like they're supposed to be mercurial you're not there's maybe to some degree they're supposed to be unknowable um and that's fine for the realms but like that's not fine for me like i i can know i i deserve to know right like um it it's they're a mystery to the residents but they don't need to be mystery to the audience um but say let me i already said that can't say it again um so that's where i'm at uh do you guys have any other final thoughts before i bring up a final listener question and then we can close her out uh i do not two one all right so for a final yahoo i mean final listener question listener question <laughs> uh from patron of the show klaus and may you know we can't have an episode without a question from klaus uh he asked would you say the story grew on you or a leaf you wanting might be barking Ooh. up the wrong tree here yeah, I mean, you guys get me. Yeah, there's nothing easy. I to think, be said. hey, oh, we get it. Hey. I think he needs to make like a tree and get out of here. <laughs> hey, thank, hey, thanks for the question, Klaus. Um, it's time for our reforging. But Sigmar Willing will be back soon. Like, subscribe, share, or leave a review. Join us on Discord, drop a tip on our Patreon. Anything you can do will spread the word of Sigmar farther than we can on our own. Chat with us anytime about your thoughts on Twitter at The Modal Realms. And Paul, where can they find you online? At PJ Shard. And Davey, where can they find you on the internet? At red underscore Zeke, or if you want to talk on the worlds, at uh, WTHcast. Excellent. Will, where can they find you on the World Wide Web? At Sever Elon, or if you want to talk Path to Glory, at Path to Story. Excellent. And I'm Aaron. You can find me on Twitter at Dos Asos, and you can find all our Mortal Realm shows and content at www.mortalrealms.com. Um, all right. Any final thoughts? Because once we start, we can't stop. There is no stop in this train. Can't stop. Won't stop. Refuse to. Ooh, no railroad crossings. Joints. Ooh, that one's good. Like that one. joints. Do you do that before every podcast and I just never see it? Is this a new thing that I'm learning about you? No, but I do do it a lot. Yeah, I do do. Um, <laughs> hmm. All, all right. Pop in the joints. I wonder what I'm missing in my diet that besides a lot of a lot joints. of things. Um, but. <laughs> If that makes my joints pop a lot. I'm probably going to die early because of it. Um, all right. <laughs> yes, for the first part, but not because of that. <laughs> That's true. If I play my cards right. Sylvaneth Society. Seems rooted in their lamentary. <laughs> hey, I'm going to leave that one alone. All right. Um, so let's talk about. We've, we've made both those jokes already, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are. We've done all three jokes. <laughs> We've done every tree joke there is. There are no more tree jokes to make. All right. Well, I'm definitely cutting mine and I'm leaving Paul's in. Um, <laughs> You're asking for trouble here, dude. <laughs> oh, oh well, see, why'd you waste that in something that he's going to cut? Uh, now he's stuck. The queen of the outcasts, Drecha. Is that how you pronounce it? I never know. Drecha. Drecha. I never say it out loud. Drecha. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Drecha. Yeah. Try ch- I don't. I don't say it out loud, and I'm not going to. So this is getting cut on my end. You're it's gonna look. Cut. You're gonna look goofy. No. <laughs>